forecast in Hartford today. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Irene. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for having me tonight. Um, just a real quick um, update as to what's going on. Not a whole lot yet. Um, we've just um, put in a lot of proposals on our own as far as bills that we would like personally to put through, um, such bills as ones that I put in as far as getting rid of the business entity tax. Um, there's some tax issues regarding construction equipment. We're looking at that in different, different, different types of bills. Um, we're looking at um, some private privatization, public-private um, partnerships with some of our nonprofits. Um, some some of them do a wonderful job and probably better than we do as a state. So we want to give some of that um, that authority over to them. That way, obviously, you know, we're not spending as much at the tax level. We can fund them probably for less than they do things on shoestrings. So a little bit of funding goes a long way for them and they'll do it much better than, again, than the state does. So that's some other things that we're looking at. Um, and we're also looking at, um, let's see what else is on this list. Uh, oh, um, we're also looking at um, cideries, people who make hard ciders, um, that they can serve the cider by glass like wineries. So it's you know some economic development things. So those are some of the things that I've personally put in, and a lot of those came from my constituents. So that wasn't um, self-made. Um, you know, ideas, that's all from all of you and who's ever come to me. Um, today we actually had the first full meeting for the uh, Education Committee, um, and we talked about um, everything that's on the docket that has come from everybody, as far as the um, topics that we're going to hit. Obviously with Senator Looney's um, new bill that you know he's put out there in the media, we haven't seen any language on that bill at all yet, but we're waiting to see what all of that's going to be. And um, we went ahead with the, um, litany or the list of all of these um, there was 30 of them on the uh, on our on our agenda for the next session and so we'll be looking at those but again nothing is really um, formulated yet and we don't have any real solid language of any bills as of yet but bills are right now being looked at and then proved and pushed forward to um, uh, get them in draft form and then, then we have something as a committee to look at is when you, the bill you're referring to, Irene, is that the uh, regionalization suggestion that a school less than 2,000 students? Yes, that's Senator Louise, um 454 bill. Um, 454, yeah. Um, the um, list of our um, topics or concerns um, that were on the list today was of everything that comes into that regionalization, which could be <coughs> services, which some schools are already doing. Some schools are already shared, you know, doing shared services of um, IT and various other things where it's cost savings to Board of Ed. So um, those things are already happening and those are conversations that are going to continue. And there's a lot of different bills that people have put in individually that's going to go into that whole group. It just happened that Senator Looney's bill that came out in the media and the, you know, the, the outline of it is, um, again, it's not any written language that we've had actually even looked at yet. So that kind of, the timing was kind of interesting, but 
because I know everybody's upset about that. Some places, some schools in some areas want the re regionalization of schools. Some people don't, but it's just going to be part of the conversation at this point. And then the white elephant in the room is the ECS money. Yep, and you know we're gonna have to wait until budget comes out. Budget's not gonna be out um, for like another four weeks, I believe, toward the end of February, like February 20th, I think is the latest date that we've heard that Governor Lamont is gonna bring out for his budget. And then once we see that, um, you know, there's a lot of um, a lot of taxes <laughs> in the uh, in the in the uh, in the news and what's gonna be in that budget. So. Um, we, if all those taxes pass, then maybe we'll have money for that. But right now, it's not looking. You know, this forecast for the state right now isn't any different than it was six months ago. But until we have the budget, something to actually go forward on, we don't really have the answer yet. So I can do this much better in about a month and a half. But well, we'll we'll have you back for that next meeting. Okay. Great. Um, any of our elected members have any questions or concerns they want to share with Irene? Has there been any discussion of uh, Alon for show? Has there been any discussion of um, deadlines for uh, the budgets? I know um, something I read that came out. Um, I think you put it out. Was um, moving up the deadline so that it would fit the municipal budgets better? Yes. So one of the concerns that we've had and that people have brought forth is the fact that we want to make sure that once the budget is out and passed and the ECS monies have been designated, whatever those are, is that we don't, we, somebody did, I don't remember who exactly it was, but somebody proposed a bill that said that the governor or anybody else can't go in after that date and pull those funds back because we know that, you know, the, just in my own two towns, you know, I mean, the heck that broke through. So, <laughs> you know, there's gonna be, um, I'm sure many other towns out there that are gonna be happy with that idea, but yeah, we definitely don't want that to, uh, to get in, in the way this year because that was a nightmare for everybody. You know, but just is that a didn't bill pass. That would, I'm sorry, is that a bill that would likely, the bill that says nobody can touch it after it's been approved, is that likely to be approved before the ECS money gets torn apart? I mean, what's the timing on that? I don't know yet. I really don't. I mean, it's, it's all within the education committee. So, you know, that obviously the, the relationship between those two are going to be discussed. Um, I will tell you, um, I'm so impressed with the people and the legislators that are on the Education Committee. Probably two-thirds of them are educators, like for many years. So they really bring to the table a lot of good expertise. I mean, as a, as a mother, that's my expertise. As a, as a legislator, as a, you know, somebody who's been involved in towns and PTAs and all that, um, you know, I bring a different you know, perspective. But truly, I'm very grateful that this is a committee that I, I asked for higher ed because I was more interested in workforce training and that kind of thing. But the fact that I got on the education committee, but I'm there with people who understand the education process um, much better than I am, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled. <laughs> So, and one last thing, um, I just want to say congratulations, East Hampton, on your kid governor. She's uh, an amazing kid, and um, Ella Briggs, and um, she uh, did her speech up at the uh, Old State House. She's on, was that a couple weeks ago? And she is Actually, amazing. Actually, it was a week ago Friday. It was it a week ago Friday? Yeah, see, they ate my schedule. Okay. <laughs> um, but it was great, and she's, um, she's awesome, so. I got a question. You're on yeah. education. I am. No. Aren't you going to uh, any discussion about teacher pensions? That's in, that's on the on list too. Absolutely. Top of the priority. We'll see when uh, Governor Lamont gets his. Uh, you know, I mean, that's those are the two things that are going to be on the top of that budget as to whether or not we can afford those. And, I mean, we have to at this point, so we have to figure out a way to pay for them. So that's going to be uh, that's going to be high on the priority list as far as his his budget. So we'll see what comes out. But we have to wait. We have to wait for to see what that is. But I'm there with you. Any other questions? Thank you very much. I know you've got to take it to another meeting. Thank you very much, Irene. Would you like me to hand those out? Or? Oh, yeah, there's um, just some major issues books here from the Capitol. If anybody wants one, you can grab it on the way back, on the way out. Or Thank you. You can pass them. I don't care what you guys want. Okay. Um, moving right along, I think we'll start. I think the way to approach what do our taxpayers expect us to provide is to, we don't have enough for everybody, so I'll sh we'll share. We'll share. We'll pass those right. Sorry, um, this is a tough question. 
um, whether our taxpayers expect us to provide, and I mean by that services as well as educational opportunities. And I don't know that we've ever tackled that question as a whole group before, but I thought it might be a good exercise tonight if we, because I think we have to very much balance what we're doing this year, and we're looking to have a little shift in that. Christopher and I are working very hard at that in um, coming to some agreement consensus between all boards as to what we think that might be. I know we're either guessing or we're coming up with a very educated guess based on our constituency or based on past, or in our case, based on past practice. <coughs> I think we would all agree that the four referendums was not a good idea, not that we planned it, but it's expensive, it delays, and then we had so many people that were very confused when they got their tax bill in January with the supplemental review. <coughs> and I'm sure you all got calls, I got calls, and the poor, uh, our poor tax collector was not happy. Um, so, I think if we can avoid that, that would be great. Um, but I don't assume to know, um, nor do I think any individual one of us does know, but I think collectively we might come up with some ideas as to what our taxpayers are expecting us to provide. Would anybody like to start? Barbara? Yeah, um, Talk loud in this room because it's okay. tough in here. <laughs> I, I, I would expect, and of course none of us know what the answer is, but I, I would think that the, in my mind the two most important things are safety for our citizens and that covers a, a big wide scope. Um, our police department, our, our um, our firemen, our first responders, all of them, um, I think that should be our priority as well as education. And those are the two things I think our children are our biggest, 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 biggest asset. And uh, we could, I'm sure no one can. Come on, last week we were told it was a <coughs> lake. Not by you. The lake, the lake. Right, so you've got safety. But I think the other two. Um, <coughs> so you've got safety and education. Yes. Uh, if I was going to start a list, <clears throat> would anybody like to add to that list? Take a different perspective and not looking at just services and safety, but for us as the boards to be able to communicate and have dialogues and have Say a common again. goal. Communication. Okay. You are, you are taking it down a different path. Yes, I am. Yeah. I mean, can I put that working as a, together, as a can I put yes. that though as a separate priority that but communication and working together and, and the other things we would, we would, I agree, the other things I would line up more with uh, dollars. Okay. So looking, but communication and understanding, is that what you said? Collaboration. Common out, oh, what'd you say? Collaboration. Collaboration. Uh, no, that's all good, like that. Anyone else? <laughs> infrastructure. Mark says infrastructure. Roads, buildings. Mm -hmm. So, and by that you're maintaining buildings, Correct. all of them. And roads. Okay. Buildings and roads, okay. Excuse me while I turn my hearing aid. This room is horrible for hearing people, especially hearing impaired. Uh, but go ahead, next, so who else? Uh, can I get my, these members first oh, and then okay. I'll go there? But thank you, I'm glad you're, Josh, did you have something? Not yet. Not yet. Hmm? Not yet. Okay. Yes, okay. Um, this may be slightly more abstract, but um, one thing that I've heard um, over and over again from, from a lot of different um, citizens is, is that they wish that they had uh, a better idea of what they would call the plan is for all these things. Where not only where are we and what we can do in the immediate future, you know, with the next budget cycle and the next one and the next, but sort of looking further down, like, Long where are we going? Yeah, yeah, just um, a master plan. Have a plan for these things. You know, we a lot of times we can't possibly pay, you know, the whole the whole amount for whatever the item is or the or the initiative. So would th would that be when you say that, Nancy? Are you thinking of um, capital projects, for example, like? big ticket items like a fire truck or a, the wing of a school or renovation of a building. Is that I what think, you think? I think that's a very, a very good example of <coughs> capital. And one, one idea I just wanted to kind of throw out there is, I, I don't know what anybody else thinks of it, but when, um, when Paul presents what he you know, is proposing um, to us, 
um, for the education budget. One thing that I, when I was sitting you know, on the other side of the audience, one thing that, I, that struck me and that I loved as a citizen was being able to see the priorities in the, the, the red, yellow, green. I don't know if anybody else looks at that. I, I think it's brilliant, personally, because it, really, it, it sort of goes along with that. It's, okay, green, what are the immediate things that, that he wants to achieve or that he thinks should be attended to? But then I always look, you know, what's in the yellow and why are these things in the red? Just to kind of, you, you get a real picture. I think of priorities that way, and on the town side, I would, as a citizen, I would. Well, wouldn't love it be nice that. if we could come away in the next meeting or two with that plan for general and education? That would be great. I, I think that would I be think awesome. I think that would kind of be what I'm looking to I think achieve. on that is just, you know, planning, but taking that proactive approach in planning, and not always having to say, "This thing is failing. We got to fix it now." And then, you know, you got to lay out the expense plan, and once you put that money aside, you don't touch it. You know, it's planning ahead for future big projects or, or just, just like you said, a future plan, I think people, and I, and I would put the lake on, on your list too because that is a priority. You What's know, your, what was yours? The lake. So I would say, yeah, the lake, definitely, you know, um, because it's, it's tourism, it brings people in, it, um, it affects, you know, real estate um, prices and housing prices, it's people that want to move here that, you know, want to enjoy the lake and they find out it's not so, Great shape, you know. They might look at Marlboro or Homie or someplace else that has a nice clean lake, you know. So it does affect a lot of people in town, you know, mm -hmm. either real estate wise or just enjoying it. Lake is up. Close. And again, planning. Planning. And plan, planning. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think we're going to kind of make that our little goal when we get all this stuff out on the table and then associate some costs with it. I think it would be nice if we could come up with our own. I will copy Paul on that because I saw that presentation last year and it was effective. It's a good issue too. It's a good issue. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's good to have not just like preparing for future expenses, but I think in the bigger picture, a mission statement for the whole town. Where do we want to see Stampton and who do we want to be in 2030? 2040 you know instead of just going okay let's look at the next fiscal year why don't we look at where we all would like to be as a, as a as a community and what we would like to see happening in the town and ask open it up to you know I know we do these polls sometimes but maybe as something new ask them what do you want to see from your other citizens and from your town in 20 or 30 years. Or what do you don't want it not to be? Right. Or what you don't want it not to be. I want you to know that if you could all talk like Lois, I wouldn't I could take my hearing aids out. Okay? <laughs> it's the voice that cuts I'm the yes. other. Yes, it is. I've been listening to it since I was two or three, yeah. but I can always hear her. Yeah. Since you were two or three, just so you might want to. <laughs> <laughs> Melissa, do you have a plan of conservation and development? Yeah, I sure do. Yeah. Yeah. And I know how did that survey and stuff was put there? into yeah. that. Okay. We've we got that, that we've got. Five years old? Yeah. We so we're reviewing it in East Adams. That was some and we, we talking And we did it, what, three or four years ago? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it has oh, it's, oh, it's, it's updated in yeah. current. Yes, it is. Yeah. yeah. That Again, might help. I just add one thing to what Lois was saying. I think, you know, basically what she's talking about is having a town strategic plan that long range vision. But that goes along with, you know, what we were just talking about, but that's, you can put a, a label on it. Anyone else want to add anything to that list? So far we have safety. And I'm assuming, Barbara, we're gonna, for that we're gonna say health and safety, because you're like, you're talking ambulance, fire, police. Sure. Yeah. Okay. And this is not in order of ranking. These are just right. what you've thrown out so far. We have health and safety, uh, education, infrastructure, lake, um, and I'm going to put slash, you know, real estate values because I think that's important for the health of our town as well. Um, what else do we have? You're just mentioning spending here. You're making a list of spending items, it seems like. What well, about the tax know, burden on people? Well, what that's if you read item four, mm -hmm. that's that. It's what, so I guess what I'm doing is developing a list of what we think is important and then we're going to need to associate some costs 
with that, and then hopefully we can get down to like what is a reasonable cost for these things, what can, ta what can tax holders, uh, taxpayers afford to pay or are they willing to pay. But I think if we don't get the items out there, and I know these are broad, but it's right. not our job as a tri board to tell the Board of Education where to cut, nor is it their job to tell us where to cut, and the Board of Finance overlooks all of that with us. So I don't, I don't think this is a session in uh, that the chief doesn't do, need, need a new vehicle or we don't need a new janitor. This is a discussion on a more philosophical level about, in general, Direction. here's the important things yeah. to us and our taxpayers, and then we'll go, we'll try to get some costs associated with it. Does that answer your question, or am I not? Do you, I mean, because we could put an income side if you want. We could, like, quite honestly, economic development. <coughs> yeah, I'll put economic development on this list because sometimes you have to spend money to help that money come in. So economic development certainly should be there. Good point. I wanted to get back to that gentleman in the audience. You said you had something. Well, uh, yeah, somebody brought up uh, infrastructure, and uh, in the uh, and I, I, that was on my list too. I spent a little time over the last couple of days working on a list and then what I thought our power dollar, our current tax bill fit into that. And one was was, was adequate maintenance. Um, during my five short years living in this town it, and, and reading newspaper articles and being active in local government in the town I came from in Vermont, I, I, it's, it never ceases to amaze me how people buy things, large things, very expensive things, and then forget about them, but they're, they're going to be there forever. And then when they die, uh, we're running around, you know, where's the money going to come from to do it? Um, and some of it's basic maintenance stuff that, that everybody knows how to do it. Mike Vanish and I have talked about that. Um, but uh, I think that should be a part of, of any major purchase, is now that we've got it, you know, how are we going to take care of it? Um, or, or if we know it's got a limited lifespan, how are we going to be sure when it dies, we've got, we've got a plan in place to replace it without running around trying to figure out where the money's going to come from. Um, and the other piece is, 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 is about the lake. Um, I've, since I'm relatively new in town, I've spent a little time kind of learning about the history of the area and talking to people. And, and at one time, uh, back in the day when people took the train to the lake and, and stayed in hotels for the summer, uh, this was a, a, an amazing place. And, and now those days are gone. Nobody can go to any place for the whole summer anymore. But, but, but the idea that it could still be uh, a place to come and spend uh, great time is fine, but in the five years I've been here, I think four of them, for a good chunk of the summer, the lake has been unusable. Uh, so why on earth would I spend whatever it costs, hundreds of dollars per weekend to come stay here when I can't even put my foot in the water? Uh, and I, I think that's a problem. I mean, I, I don't live that far. I can I drive down with I'm my I'm going to suggest to you that yeah. this group, in the five years you've been here, you couldn't possibly have heard all the stories or read all the studies. But <clears throat> I would suggest that you attend the February 10th meeting at Angelico's where they're having a forum on the lake. And then you too will be as perplexed, confused, and have a headache like we do on exactly the best way to handle that lake. But you really should go because they, they do it every couple of years and it's coming up February 10th. It's three to five at Angelico's. I, I, if there's, last time they didn't really have enough room upstairs, which is where they did it, so maybe they're gonna move it downstairs. But, in all seriousness, it's uh, valuable. You know, if anybody that's interested in that should go because it's it is a very very complex issue. But, but I'm sure it is. I mean, I know we have the same problem with Lake Champlain and, and another yeah. resort type lakes in, in Vermont. So yeah. it's not a, it, it's not a unique problem, but it's still yeah. a problem. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, and the only other thing I, I had was was, um, was uh, about somebody said, "What's the plan?" And, and and I really think that's always a good question to ask: is what is what is the plan? And and that sometimes that that's a little vague in terms of you know where are we going with with, with the town? What do we want to what do we want Main Street to look like in 25 years, 30 years, whatever? And there were some good organizations out there uh, that that help with that kind of planning. Main that Street USA comes Main to mind. Main Street USA is yeah. a good one. Yes. Yeah. And we've uh, actually we've <coughs> conferred with them with regard to our. Main Street and water. So we're, we are working. Our, our uh, town manager has worked with them. I think our planner has as well. So, but thank you for that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, anyone else have anything they want to add to this particular list of of what our taxpayers and we um, think that uh, we should be providing and taking care of? 
if we were going to take these six things, I suppose we could try because we have you know a lot of four minutes on this topic or five to prioritize them. So by show of hands, <coughs> so think about this list. We have health and safety, which is pretty big, but it's it's one unit. Um, education, infrastructure, which certainly includes building maintenance and roads repairs. Um, lake and slash real estate values, and, is, and if anything else comes up, and economic development, and I, I have to add water to this list also. Yeah. 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 Can I throw one more on there? You still got your pen out? Yeah. 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 And it goes along with economic development, I, I suppose. Well, what is my incentive 10 years from, you know, the 10 year, 20 year, 30 year plan? Can I afford to stay here 20, 30 years from now? Ten years from now, my kids are out of school. I'm educating retirement. What's my incentive to stay in East Hampton? Yeah. I, I at, think, at that cost. I think at priorities, that's because I have a few for what are the taxpayers are willing to spend. I think that's perfect where that goes. And I agree with you, Eric. Um, and that'd be one of my comments is when we get there is Number it's like four. oh we've, yeah. we've got this master plan and it's what are you willing to pay for it. What I want to know is what does everyone think an acceptable mill rate is going to be? Because that would be the bottom line, but I, I don't want to get, I'd rather we'll wait, get to wait till we get to that other If, that if other we part. can't come up with this, but I just want to try a rough thing here. So here's our topics again. Health, our, yeah, our categories. What? I'm having a problem prioritizing. Yeah. Oh, really? Uh, uh, yeah. Putting a one through ten. There, on wouldn't, list. Couldn't there be some, maybe there's three that are number one. I, I, I see it as we, Agree that that list are the priorities of the town. Okay. So you don't need as a group. You don't I, need a personally. I don't. I think we need a way to address them all, but I don't. I, I'm not comfortable putting the number on each one. What's more important? Than they're all interrelated. I'm sorry. They're all interrelated. Yeah, a lot of we prioritize when they all affect. Well, if that's how we feel, then that's great. Does everybody feel the same way? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Then we're not prioritizing. Oh, Pete, I'm sorry, Pete. Yeah. Oh, he's got to disagree. That's okay. I know, I want him to. <laughs> and now that what your number one is somebody else's. Exactly. Four. Yeah. When we come to prioritizing anything, I think we as a town have to think of the health safety issues, which encompass the police department, fire department, roads and everything. Yeah, I think you have to start at some, uh, some point. Education, the lake, are all priorities. Then it comes to the dollars, allocating the dollars to your priorities. That's where the rubber hits the road. I think that's yeah. why you need some sort of a prioritization cool. system. I agree. If they all cost the same, sure. Then a priority well, I mean, <laughs> if we're talking the red, if we're talking the red, green, and yellow system that Paul used, uh, these could all be. Was red the highest, Chris? What, what well, color red was, was green, like red. green? Yeah, green was right. what they were going to do. Yellow was the next step, yeah. and red was the uh, holding off. Here's our, here's our I'm just trying to, I mean, so all these things we've just listed would be um, green. green, which is yeah, recommended yeah. for inclusion in the budget. Okay, these are all green. My chart's done. No, <laughs> no need to the other colors right now. And, and that's well, fine. And the other part of it is uh, once you establish these priorities, it, it does come down to what you're saying, Mark. Who's willing to pay? That, to me, falls in the line of educating the public. And I really, really don't think we do enough on educating the public on the tax dollars spent. I mean, we all know the drill. That town government is spending money here, that's been. And if, if they don't have the information, then they go with what's out there. Now, the best we can do 
It's put as much information out there. Educate, educate, educate. People will spend money. Now, there's a limit to everything. People can, uh, the, people, the town can only afford so much. Yeah. And I mean that when I say the mill rate, the taxes. There's only so, so many dollars in that pot. And we have to be uh, mindful of that. But I can't stress enough the education in, on the taxpayer. People think I don't like Mr. Smith. I like Mr. Smith because we pay him to do a great job for our school system. But one of the things I think he does very well is educate, educate that group within the town. Give them information, information, information. Personally, I think we're paying him every dime what he's worth when he does that. We need to learn to do that. I think we moved on to item four. Can I just say and just to correct you, Pete, it wasn't that anybody thought you didn't like Mr. Smith. Well, you just know he doesn't really care for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Melissa. whatever. Melissa, can I just add one more thing? Throw out one more thing. Um, I guess it has to do with economic development, but just um, revenue in general and um, you know, looking at increased revenue. And again, that affects or interwoven with a lot of these different things. But, um, you know, looking for cost savings. I mean, we on education are always looking for cost savings. Always. But that's um, still item four. And so, so, cost savings. You know, cost savings. What can we do in, in, <coughs> in you know, what can we do differently? What can we... Shared you services. Know, what is education is that doing that the town's not doing? What's the town doing that education's not doing? You know, just... Just revenue increase. So I'm going. starting the list for item number four now. I'm starting with shared services slash cost savings, which we I know we've been doing some of that at, at the general government level as well, yeah. and we all we all should be. Um, so what do what are taxpayers willing to pay for? Uh, maybe that's a redundant question, and maybe we've already answered it because I think the seven or six priority items, green items that we just identified are those things. I think how much, maybe that is how I should have worded that, how much are they willing to pay and where can we get some of that money? Eric's got a very good point that in our long range forecasting, it should be how many of us can afford to stay here when we have retired? How, how much are our retirees struggling right now? Um, so as progressive as we might want to be, we also have to be mindful that we don't want to be a town without senior citizens, citizens or veterans, or our kids not being able to say the same old thing we've heard forever and ever. If I was going to ask all of you what um, and or how you thought taxpayers are willing to spend, I don't care if you do it in terms of mill rate or, or by category, but give me some ideas. Right. I, I, don't think, I think we should not be afraid of the shared services to start small. I think we always think, oh, that means we have to, we have to consolidate the school, we have to merge with Portland or wherever, it doesn't matter. I, I, don't think, I think if we start uh, something small and, and, and make it work and show them that this can work and it can move up from there and we might get more people involved also in the process. If it, it's right with them, you know. If it's right with them, they're going to help, of course. Huh? Would it be fair to say that everybody at this table agrees? With the, uh, at these tables, agree mm -hmm. with that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have consensus on that. Check. What else? Uh, revenue, income, uh, <coughs> economic development. Uh, some of the things that you just talked about. Uh, I don't know how we can directly relate that to making our budget palatable for everyone. Uh, at the fourth referendum, you had a survey. Is it too high? Is it too low? Is it just right? Do you have the results of that survey? Yes, they were both too high. The budget was too high. That's why we were defeated less than three, three times before that? Is that surprising? So what's your, what's your 
So, what are you concluding from that? Like, what am I writing here that they were both that we that we were too high last year? Might have been too high for the first three budgets. So we were too high right out of the gate. That's contrary to everything that yeah. I was that, yeah. in town told me. Well, not well, really, because it's with the last referendum. Yeah. Both passed, but they both are voted too high. By right, no, well, they both passed, survey but, but the survey yeah. question yeah. did say yeah. both. Both questions on the survey asking if general government or education were too high or too low, they were both too high. Those were two separate questions. Your choice was too high, too low, just right. Um, but what I'm saying is the responses that I heard from people who live in town were more in perspective of the education budget has been slashed. We're not going to pass the town budget until something is done about that. Yeah. That's what I heard. So that we did. Right. So that right. we did. Right. So, but that's, that's, that's contrary to. Uh, Oh, well, it's not contrary. It's not contrary to what's in writing. No. Exactly. It's this not isn't right. Right. So, 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 I think this is your staff. What's up? Maybe that question, if you had, it depends on where it played in the referendum, right? Like, if you had put that question on there when you got the resounding no, you might have gotten a different response. I mean, the first time, the first referendum. Yeah. 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 Do you know what I'm saying? And so when the parents came back and did all that, I, I just think that you can't really cut and dry that because you're not putting them on every single referendum. We decided at a certain point we were putting them on there. I think it depends on which referendum they went on. It might, you might have different results. That's all. Okay. Do you all agree that that question should be on every referendum? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think maybe yep. for a while. Yep. Yep. Uh, why a while? Why a while? Right? I would just do it. Why not? Yep. That's my thought. But I want to do you all agree. I'm telling you, I am getting Wasn't there, there are three parts to that? Too low, too, too high, high, or just, just right? right. Yep. Yep. You take the just rights and the two lows, add those together against the too high, what do you get? Oh, that kind of logic. Why don't you do it the other way? I really do not want to go down this road <laughs> yeah. now. Right. We can, and if this happens, every time you put a question on the ballot, somebody has to interpret it whether it's a majority one way or a majority the other way, everybody gets to interpret what that means. One by 50 votes, I mean 50 yes. Well, they really didn't mean that because of the other vote. Let's get off that page. That's not gonna service us right now. If the consensus is it should be on every ballot, that's a different issue. Yeah, well, I mean, I think what I was, what you were saying was that so that over a long period of time, you can study the results instead of using them as a reactive kind of something to do or look for your answer. Use it over a while. I, uh, but I think that if we were going to do it, I agree, Lois. It shouldn't be on the fourth one. That, that suggestion just came to us, I think, from you guys for the fourth one. Right. If you're going to do it, it should be on the ballots that we print every time right. we have a referendum. That would be my thought. But I don't. I'm just wondering: Do we all feel that way, or do we not? Yes. 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 I mean, if you want to take a hand, was that? Say that again. Do does everyone think that they would like to see the question, the three-part question, on any referendum ballot we? Go to referendum with in the future. In the future, not, obviously. Mm -hmm. Not the first one. Yep. Not the first. Yes. One. Not the first one. Why not? I don't. Why not? Well, it's okay. We can take a vote on it. We can see how everybody. We can just see how everybody likes it. it is. If you have it, Josh. Yeah. Josh doesn't like it on the first one. He'd rather to put it on the second one if the first one fails. Okay. I just want to make sure everybody understands that. How do you all feel? Yes or no? You would like it on the first one? Referendum? I like, I like we've done the, this. Oh, I'm sorry, Ted, go ahead. I just like it on the first one, so if, if we see it goes down hard and we have the question yeah, on there, we can adjust you know to the second budget and maybe we might get something passed. Yeah. 
Last year was a damn embarrassment because we didn't compromise. And we didn't look to see which what people are voting yes and which ones are saying no. That's why it went four times. We didn't look at the voters and what they wanted. The, the majority of them. A lot of this? Oh, Janine was going to say something. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm done. I'm good. <laughs> uh, this, this is the first time that question's been on the ballot. And so I'd like to go back and um, maybe Jeff can enlighten us. Uh, I don't mean tonight, but if we go back and look at other times it's been on the ballot, uh, what's the result been? And has it been useful in the long run? But I also don't think it's been consistent, right? It has, oh, it's never been consistent. We've okay. used it. So we're, 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 we're talking we're about it before having consistency, consistency and, process. I don't know, and process. I don't know if the consistency will show us anything. Sure. But, it's, but it's and then at least you I, I just know, right? I think it just gives you a feel for that particular referendum that day, but mm -hmm. I still don't Maybe. think that's invalid information. I still think it's interesting yeah. to know. And it could also show your trend one way or the other. I mean, let's face it, if, if both questions pass, it doesn't matter what the answer is. Exactly. You know, uh, yeah, exactly right. right. So if you it's don't have it on that first one, then you don't people, know what step uh, It's a feel-good question, mm -hmm. folks. People, yeah. and people, I think, like having it. So mm -hmm. we go back to affordability. Uh, can we just solve this? Was this oh. something you'd like to see on, the ref on a referendum? Yes, I've got yeses yes. here. What are we here? Yes. I've got a no with Josh. Yep. Yes. Alana? Janine? Yeah. Yes. This group? Yes. yes. Okay, Josh, you're off the, off the island on this one. Sorry. This is the first one. <laughs> Question. I'm just writing this down. We have consensus on a couple things here. I'm excited. All right. Affordability. The reason I'm glad that, the reason I asked Jeff here, I think what I'd like to do right now is just say, is put out there what we know the requests are. Right now, the the superintendent has recommended to this board who hasn't discussed it yet, correct? We are starting digging into it tonight. Okay. Right, we're still right now. Out here. Um, <laughs> at uh, 2.56, I want what I'd like to determine is what our mill rate would be right for this coming year with the requests that are out there. So we have 2.56 for education. And Jeff, the request from Mike for general government is what percentage? That's not in yet. That's due on Thursday. A hint. A hint. I thought he was at 1.25. Am I wrong? 1.25% increase? Yeah, my, yeah. Yeah, no. I'm wrong. Okay. <laughs> 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 no. I think I'll 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 more than that. that. Yeah. 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 Would you be any more subtle? <laughs> Is it high. three and a half? What is it? Is that too high, too low, or too high? Too high, too low. I don't know. I don't We're still waiting for all the way from Public Works. So we just can't go there right now. Right now. Uh, we do know capital, however. Uh, capital is at. I think there's what, a 50% increase in capital? 50. And that does yeah. that not include that, and that does not include what we're sending to uh, to bond. bond. No. Correct. That, yeah, that excludes. That the, excludes the, that. Yeah. Correct. The hell! I was on that committee. I don't remember what's on it that increased at fifty percent. I know we've got technology for the schools. That's not new. But we took out a fire truck to bond. We took out just so you all know, a fire truck is going to be bonded. The um, boiler, the boiler, the, boiler, the big the big nut the is the boiler and the radio. 275. The radio. The radio. Radios are the big. And the, oh, the biggest nut with the radio is for 800,000. So we have some huge public safety and education issues, and but also they're being addressed in a bond for this year. We'll be voting on that March 11th as a town, but it's a $550,000 fire truck, 800,000 in the radios, and the uh, boiler 275. I'm sorry, what's the truck? I think 675 is the fire truck. Okay, pardon me. 675. What was, what was the boiler again? Boilers only. Cheap. Boilers are the cheapest ones. 275. 275. Yeah. Yeah. Chris is very happy to tell you it's the cheapest one. We've been trying for years. You need <laughs> boiler. You do. Yeah. do. And yes. the radios we need. Anyway, even without those things, the capital uh, requests are a little high, but they all seem very necessary. I'm sure they are. All right, so then that little exercise, we'll have to wait till our next meeting where we try to figure out what all these, what both requests are going to equal for a mill rate increase. And I think that's the number we can more easily discuss as a group at our next tri board meeting. Quick, can I make a quick statement off of everything else? Just about a fundraiser that I'm doing. <coughs> and I, the 
this is a great audience. I just want to be able to tell everybody about it. Yeah, fun, okay. She's still selling Girl Scout cookies. No, I'm not. <laughs> Hold on one second. Okay. I'm going to let you end with that. Thank you. Um, is it unfair of me to ask that when we re adjourn, reconvene, we'll discuss the numbers in a little more detail? And uh, don't need to go into any more of that tonight. I think we've done well with consensus so far. I like the idea of the master plan, the red, green, but quite honestly, we're all green. So for our color chart, we've agreed that those things are all important by consensus. We've also agreed that we can do a better job communicating. We can work on that. And we have agreed that we would like that question on um, every referendum going forward. Okay. And then, so before we go, can we agree on our next meeting date? And then Lois is going to do a sales pitch. <laughs> no Mondays. Yeah. Yeah. Not on no Mondays. Mondays. No more Monday meetings. Mark's just about them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, Mark. <laughs> uh, it is. I, I wouldn't want to go real late to have another one. I mean, Board of Ed's going to be working their budget. We're going to know Mike's budget by the end of this week. Um, and, and now, again, it's, it's, and we've had this conversation time constraint. We have to have our budget to the top by March 1st. Right, so then how about if we so get together? After two night, after tonight, that gives us two meetings we have. Uh, how about if we meet next Tuesday, the 5th? And that agenda will be to specifically discuss the request from the town manager and the superintendent and where we think. At 6 o'clock, same thing, 6 o'clock. Does that work for everybody? <laughs> Tuesday the 5th work? Mm -hmm. uh, same time, 6, we'll be out here by 7. Okay, 6 p.m., tri-board, uh, and we'll be ready to talk, not weeds, just philosophically money and how much and what we think we can do. Questions, concerns, comments, suggestions for the next meeting other than that? Nancy. Just a quick thing with the, with the red, yellow thing. Um, when, I, when I was talking about that, I, I appreciate that that was included in um, you know, the, the consensus for the general priorities, but I think also, I don't know if it's possible this year or now, it might be too late, but maybe at this next meeting or as we talk, if, if the town items, the more specific items, could also be looked at the way that the Board of Ed um, budget is looked the at town. the priorities. The, the, the actual numbers for, for different departments or, oh my God. you know, ours for the budget. Ours, not, not item by item, it's really just small in general. compared to yours. You could read that overnight. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, then we'll, have, nice we'll, we'll have them. Yeah. We'll, we'll bring Mike's my proposal with us. And we already have, we'll have copies of uh, Paul's proposal, we'll bring copies of Mike's okay. proposal. How about that? Kathy, are you, can, can, can we make that happen that we have copies at the next meeting of Mike's and, uh, and Paul's proposals? And actually, if you could email them ahead of time so people could take a look at them. I don't know, how long, how long is the pause? Right there in front of you. Well, that's by the categories. So oh, yeah, we've got that. That's the brief. You did yeah. email yeah, that to us. I have that on email also. So, all right, just bring Don't send her. It's okay. Yes, good idea. Uh, so, we'll see each other on the 5th, and Lois has a sales pitch. So, just so everybody knows, I don't know if you have heard about Sarah Barney. We've all been on the Let's Talk East Hampton page. We're doing a fundraiser for her. Um, it would be great if everybody in the town supported her. If you don't know who she is, I can tell you about it afterwards. But briefly, she had a car accident the day after Christmas and broke both her legs, and she's had several surgeries, and she was a dancer and an aerial acrobat. So we're having a little bit of a fundraiser for her, and by a little bit, I mean St. Clement's Castle has generously donated their facility on a Friday evening, February 22nd. Okay, it'll be from doors open at 6.30. It'll go till 10 p.m. There'll be a buffet dinner. Tickets are $35, which is very, very, very reasonable for that. All proceeds will go to Sarah. Um, and I would appreciate if you, even if you can't attend, that you purchase a ticket. Um, it, she's a great gal. She's suffered a lot. And it would be really, really helpful if you all spread the word. Uh, I'm selling tickets. Uh, we're getting them off the printer as soon as we can. And uh, the mom, Judy Barney, is. But I would rather you go through me just because, you know, she's got a lot on her plate. Um, if anybody would like to help me that day, you could help me. And, I'm, you know, I need people to run the raffle. 
I have an MC. We have Connecticut's kid governor coming, I think, which will be fun. Um, her dad, uh, Chris Briggs, will be emceeing the event. It's going to be awesome. So please, please get the word out and please, please purchase a ticket. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Rose. Uh, Mark has the numbers from our yes, no, maybe so vote. I had a recording. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, sure. He did. Have <coughs> Sorry about that. I thought you wrote it down. No. I'd have to play it, but I didn't want to interrupt. Okay, never mind. Never. We'll okay. talk about that next time. Right. Never mind. We'll we'll start. Start. Yeah, we have another two hour email. Motion to adjourn. Okay, we'll be up here in All those in favor? Just kidding. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
side. Oh, get the gavel. You always told me to. Are you well set? Okay. Thank you all and those that uh, were at the tri board meeting prior to this. Thank you for coming to that. I think we're in the step in the right direction. Uh, please join me in the pledge to play. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Okay. Jesus. Board of Finance, you guys are still here. We have three members, right? Yeah. Anything you want to add in about how things are going? Okay. Updates from our principals and director of curriculum. Mary, you want to start? Sure, no problem. So we are in our mid-year assessment window, which just closed on Friday. So that means that at each of our grade levels, the teachers are taking this time to really reflect on the progress that students have made, uh, to analyze all of their growth, in particularly reading and math is the main focus for us, so that they can plan targeted instructional supports for students in the regular classroom. This is also, <clears throat> excuse me, a very key window for our instructional specialists who support the classroom teachers. There's a tremendous amount of time and effort that goes into looking at each individual child as a learner and making sure they have the appropriate supports um, to maintain positive growth as well as enrichment opportunities. So this is a really um, important period in the year for us to dialogue around student learning. So a lot of that go is going on um, at each of the schools um, as well as at the high school. We just had a midterm exam, so this is a, a key time in the school year for us. Um, additionally, our Professional Development and Evaluation Committee, which is a group of teacher leaders from across the district, met on Friday uh, to review our progress throughout the year in terms of professional learning. Um, we're planning ahead for February 15th, which is our next full day professional learning opportunity for teachers, which is really critical time for us. Um, there's a number, as we discussed at our last board meeting, there's a number of key initiatives that we want to make sure all of our certified staff have access to, as well as give opportunities for specialized learning by grade level or content area. Um, we're excited that on February 15th, uh, CEA is coming to lead our certified teachers in a workshop on um, the concept of implicit bias um, and really inviting our staff to be reflective practitioners about who they are as individuals and we all bring a lens to our work and we want to recognize that so that we can support all students as individuals um, and really deeply know them and understand their experiences. So um, our K-5 team will have that for half the day and our 6-12 team will have that for half the day. The other half of the day will be um, either grade level or department work. We have some major initiatives at each building that the teachers will have some dedicated time to collaborate around. So for example, center school is very focused as they continue to roll out next generation science standards. We have different initiatives across Memorial from math workshop instruction to more NGSS to foundations. Um, and middle school will be heavily working by department area um, as they have all of those initiatives going on and the high school, um, we're really looking forward to some, uh, some curriculum work as well as looking forward to opportunities to connect our classroom instruction to the SAT, which is coming up in March. Um, we've started looking ahead too, but I'll save those updates for another time. Our administrative team is also gonna have some really um, excited professional learning opportunities later this week. They are attending a session that CREC is holding on ways to produ productively address hurtful and biased comments or actions in schools, which is something that all schools are really taking a close look at, how we are supportive in that process and calibrated across buildings. As well as this Friday, uh, Lucy Calkins from Teachers College at Columbia University will be um, in Connecticut looking at leadership of Readers and Writers Workshop, which has been, as you know, a major initiative for us. So our administrators will have the opportunity to work directly with her, which is truly a world-class learning opportunity, so we're excited for that. Um, and just to follow up from our last meeting, I had the opportunity uh, to meet with the Prevention Partnership uh, last week uh, with James around follow-up on health curriculum and opportunities to kind of combine our efforts around grant funds 
to really work on our substance, uh, substance abuse prevention planning in our health curriculum and start to look from that balcony view of K-12, how are we gonna grow that and integrate that with programming we already have in place. Um, and if we can partner with them on some of those grant funds, it would free up uh, potentially some opportunities for us to continue to grow the rest of our um, health and wellness curriculum. So that's exciting to really uh, see that move forward. Great. Questions from Mary before we jump? And he's got his hand up, ready to go. All right. Uh, Mrs. Clark put together a very detailed uh, review of what's going on in the district. Mrs. Gadori and I are also really looking forward to being some lead learners and going out to the PD this week. We did finish up our second diagnostic in the I-Ready platform at Memorial. We saw some nice growth across the building. Uh, really pleased with the performance. And one thing that uh, Mrs. Clark didn't mention that we're looking forward to this Friday is World Weed Aloud Day. Senator Needleman just reached out to me and is looking forward to coming in and joining a group for a read aloud. Mrs. Flannery has set up a memorial lot, a fireplace, and cozy reading area, so uh, classic will be cycling to enjoy that celebration. The only thing I'll add is as part of Bell Ringer Day, if you haven't had a chance to check out Memorial's Facebook page, there are lots and lots of examples of our class of 2030 and 2031, oh. and um, as future bell ringers and who we are. 30, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> Taking back off of that, uh, I'd like to thank the middle school for being a gracious host of the class of 2026. Um, great feedback in terms of the excitement, getting off the bus from both students and teachers. Um, Willy Wonka Kids begins tomorrow. Uh, our new play director, Carrie Totorici, who is actually an employee of Memorial School, will join us as the director. Uh, the fourth grade music demonstration will take place this Friday at 1.30. There's no formal winter concert for the fourth grade, but to show the growth from the beginning of the year until now is, is nothing short of amazing. Um, so that will, again, take place in our gymnasium at 1.30. It's open to the parents. And the invention convention is next Wednesday the 6th. Um, classes will tour the Invention Convention that will take place also in the gymnasium and it's open to the public at 5.30 the afternoon of the 6th. Thanks, Kristen. A lot coming back at you. Thank you to you and to Frank. Um, the fifth grade visit was coupled with the eighth grade visit to the high school, so as you can imagine, we're <laughs> utilizing you know, three yeah. buses to do this. The logistics of it were, were pretty incredible. Uh, somehow, some way, Eighth graders came back in the door with two minutes before their lunch wave, and it was just, it was just perfect. So I think uh, we'll have to stick to this format maybe for the upcoming, upcoming years. Um, so as I mentioned, eighth grade, fifth grade came in, eighth grade went out, uh, both had very positive experiences. Really, uh, eighth graders came back pretty excited and uh, wide-eyed about the you know, potential of coming here to school. So that was nice. We have been in communication with the Anti-Defamation League uh, our PTO has graciously given us a uh, considerable amount of funding to be able to put together not just the spot treatment, but an actual program to address uh, tolerance and acceptance within our school system and really start to develop that culture. That's going to include a focus group of students. It's also going to be uh, looking at an actual day, one day program for the anti-defamation to come in. And then after that, look at building a uh, school-based organization for students that really want to try to make a difference in our culture. Uh, we had the Step Up concert, uh, concert, not to be confused with the Anti-Defamation League Step Up. <laughs> um, that's going to be another great event for us March 19th where all the schools are going to get together and uh, they'll come here to the high school and perform for each other. Uh, Kids Can Teach program is back at the middle school. Getting that back up and running, it's a Thursday afternoon tutorial program. Uh, we have a couple amazing teachers that are going to be facilitating it, and we're also looking uh, to high school students that act as mentors and tutors for that program. So it's really a nice opportunity for us to connect with high school and get some tutorial support. Uh, Sports on 66, we I think are in the initial phases of a kind of a partnership with them to be able to have an after school program through their facility. Um, they're really pretty excited about it. They will offer some activity for students, but also uh, some support with their academics as well. And last two weeks ago, yeah, two weeks ago, I believe, 
uh, we had our band and chorus concert up here at the high school, and it was just so nice to be in such a beautiful facility. So that's it. So at the high school, exams concluded last Wednesday, which means we have predominantly happy students and happy teachers to be on the other side of that. Uh, Bell Ringer Day was this past Friday at our last board meeting. I had shared uh, essentially no details on the program whatsoever because it was top secret. Yeah. So uh, now that the program has, has, has come and gone, uh, the theme was Generations of Bell Ringers. Uh, a couple of quick highlights for you. So uh, Brandy somewhat alluded to this, but there was this um, really cute video called the Future Bell Ringers, and it had students from Memorial Center in middle school in uh, just short of a three minute video and talking about and showing their enthusiasm about uh, looking forward to coming up to the high school. And uh, we also welcome guests of honor to the high school, Ted Turner from the class of 64, Tom Perdero from the class of 86, and Cheryl Bollier Waldman from the class of 01. And joining them was uh, retired science teacher, Linda Chambers. So they all shared with the students what it means to be a bell ringer and, and had some, some nice comments to, to share during that, that assembly. It is available for, uh, for those to view on Facebook, the assembly in its entirety. And my sincere thanks to Mr. Lehman, Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Gonzalez for all their collaboration and for what we did in our respective buildings uh, to give a tip of the cap to Bell Ringer Day. Finally, we have a poetry, poetry Out Loud competition. The last round is tomorrow, where a school-wide winner will be selected. And that's in the morning, right? It is, yes. Yeah. Uh, it's right around, I want to say 9.15, 9.30. All the special schedules we've had the last two weeks, they're all starting to blur. <laughs> <laughs> it's called 9.21. Oh. <laughs> oh, that was a pretty good estimate. Uh, there we go. Thank you, Mrs. Clark. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's 9.21. <laughs> Question for any of the schools? <laughs> Good job. Too bad. I'm sorry, I missed Bell Day. I was away, but yeah, I watched it. It was very nice. Audience and citizens, open it up. Any comments, questions, remarks? No. Hearing none, we will move on. Motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Joanne, second. second. Lois, comments. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, no recognition right now. So then our students are probably recovering from their finals. They need extra time. Yeah. Personnel has not met. We nothing going on there. Policy curriculum. Policy did not meet this evening, but we uh, have some first grade later on. Okay. Yeah, there's three, I believe, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Finance, transportation, building grounds. Um, has not met since last last time when I reported, so tonight. Anything we'd learn? Um, nope. Meeting coming up uh, next week. And that open house, grand opening is still set for uh, Sometime, right after the elevators. Okay, all right. So. Nothing with the building committee? Okay. We haven't met, okay. Now, we are going to turn over superintendent report and we will dig in. Uh, last meeting, I gave a presentation. We went very quickly through the budget. I thought it would be uh, wise tonight for you to hear of some of the new things um, that the principals uh, have requested um, and then some of the things that aren't necessarily in the budget, um, but they can bring those to life uh, because Obviously, the board has to make some uh, decisions as to what to send forward. Uh, I just want to reiterate uh, that this budget uh, makes, for this community, unprecedented moves towards uh, STEM programming, STEM courses, STEM opportunities uh, in pre-K through 12. And it's, it's a direction that um, I know a lot of us feel very strongly about uh, to make sure that our students are prepared for especially careers that are going to be um, long term available right in, in Connecticut. I think a lot of the, uh, the frustration with Connecticut is we've created uh, job opportunities that our, um, our students are not prepared for or we've created uh, universities uh, working hard to keep our students in state and I think we've got to make sure that our students are prepared for the best jobs in, in the state. I talked a lot about that last, um, last, last meeting. You're going to hear some of those positions brought to life. 
As you go through the budget document, and I, I want to stress this, if I did not stress it uh, enough um, at the first meeting, that a lot of the teaching positions that you see, uh, we've created those by what we're calling a, a, you know, a high impact realignment of, of staffing. But I thought it was important for people to see the new positions in the budget and realize that they're available because we're moving, we're moving people around. As far as teachers go, this is a, a net zero budget. Uh, we're not increasing teaching staff at all. We are just redefining positions and creating new positions by moving people around or putting our efforts into, into different areas. Uh, but I think it's res the responsibility for us is to, to create some excitement about where we want to go and, and do it for as reasonably, reasonably as possible, and I think we've done that uh, with the budget. So I'm gonna start with Mary, then we're gonna move to, to Frank, and then down through the buildings. I've asked them to just highlight a few of the items, um, and you'll find them on, um, we highlighted them on pages uh, seven, eight, nine, and 10 in your, in your budget. So uh, we'll start with Mary, and she will jump uh, right to page Eight. Is this something that everyone has? If you don't have a copy of this, or if you didn't bring it back from last time, or you need a copy, these are right on the on the table. The same information is up over my head. Okay. Yes. And in principles, if you would come down, just so you're on the uh, live stream. I'm going to move. So I'm off. How's that? You can say what I'm used to. I'm going to go sit next to those men. Oh, no, I'm sitting next to those men. Yeah, I'm going to sit next to those men. Here, you're working on both. The new track? No, you're on page 8. Oh, that one. The new one. No. No. The other one. Yes. Jeff is really ready. He's standing forward. I'm not going to go totally in the floor. I'm going to go to the floor. Okay, there we go. Jeff started it. Yeah. Jeff started it. I think we're ready. Okay. Okay, I'm going to speak to you about two positions this evening, um, both of which would be placed at our middle school, the STEM coordinator and a literacy specialist. I'd like to start with the STEM coordinator. I think this position is one that we are, uh, and I should say this would be at Gold Center and Middle School, uh, and this position is one that we're really, really excited about for the district. It's really a missed opportunity um, if we don't have the, uh, the, the staffing in place to coordinate our instruction that we've been working so hard to build. Uh, four through me. When we look at the work the district has been doing to this point, we've focused a good deal in the last few years to make sure that we're catching up with school districts um, that, that we really strive to align towards when we look at both our science and math instruction. And our teachers have done a tremendous job in engaging in new learning around mathematics instruction as well as science. You've heard me talk a good deal about um, our math programming as well as next gen science standards. And so when we look at the number of teachers who a STEM coordinator would be able to help facilitate, just at the middle school alone, it's 10 teachers. We have four math teachers, four science teachers, um, and two teachers on our specialist wheel that would also be um, directly supported by the STEM coordinator. Uh, we have a computer technology teacher as well as the applied math and science. And we're really looking at this position as an opportunity for someone to come in to be very dynamic, to work across those settings, and to wear a number of hats. It's going to have to be someone who's really comfortable moving between projects and juggling those demands, and who's excited to help grow both our uh, professional capacity of the teaching staff as well as work directly with students. And I think that's something I really want to stress about the STEM coordinator position. It's someone who works with teachers in their instructional model and ensures that we're working across classroom settings as well as provides direct support to students. Um, so this person would have the opportunity to work in some of our existing structures. So for example, currently our math intervention structure um, at the middle school, which is a state required system, um, would be something we could grow and enhance. And this person would directly do the analysis of what are our needs in that area and how can we uh, plan for those students, as well as the enrichment opportunities in math. They would then look at that same opportunity in science, 
Um, they would be able to directly provide services to students who either um, have areas to grow and build their skills or for students who we see as ready for a challenge perhaps beyond their grade level. The STEM coordinator um, would not just be at the middle school, as I said, but would also work at center school. We're excited to outfit center school uh, primarily with grant funds, uh, with a maker space, which would allow them to really take their science and math learning and integrate it and have a dedicated lab space at center school, which we've never had, to make that learning come alive. So again, this person would be across those buildings and both with students directly as well as teachers. Uh, we know that the best way for teachers to grow is job embedded professional learning, which means instructional coaching. And so um, our STEM coordinator would be able to provide that direct service for our teachers. So if there's a new lesson, a new kind of lab that they're going to be working with students on, they can coordinate that with that teacher, help facilitate that lesson, and ensure that we're only providing um, the best instruction to our students. In addition to all of that, this person can also do something that our district doesn't have um, a, a tremendous offering, particularly at center and, and middle school level, which is looking at community partnerships. We've been able to do some of that and provide those value added experiences for our students, but that's something that our colleagues in the magnet world do a good deal of. And we'd really like to grow that for our students. Uh, for example, Pratt & Whitney, located conveniently in both Middletown and East Hartford, does a lot of partnerships with school districts to help grow those STEM opportunities and to provide students direct access to real-world application of those opportunities. And we'd like to see our, our STEM coordinator help to facilitate those kinds of partnerships. That's just one example. There are many more that we could access to give our students the chance to see their learning beyond the walls of the school. We know that the learning doesn't stop uh, when they leave our school and learning doesn't just live there. We wanna make sure that they get out and have those opportunities. I really believe the 4-8 timing of this position is critical. We've worked so hard at Memorial to expand our instructional practice and ensure that our students are leaving that building with their foundational skills intact. And if we can really move the needle fourth through eighth grade on the skill level of our students and the opportunities that, that they're having, um, I think the sky's the limit for our already very successful high school. Um, and our students would really have a world-class opportunity to go and further their education in any institution um, that they would choose or go directly into the workforce with strong skills. So that, that STEM coordinator position we really see as a game changer. In addition, I'd like to speak to you about the literacy specialist position that we're um, recommending for East Hampton Middle School. Uh, this is, as you, many of you know, very close to my heart. I've recommended this position for many years now. Uh, it's a position that used to exist. We'd really be restoring that position at East Hampton Middle School. Uh, you know, ultimately, schools have many responsibilities uh, to our students, but making sure that our students have a literate life is probably paramount because we know that reading is thinking. And the more that we grow our students' ability to engage with rich and complex literature and text resources, the more we know they're growing their thinking capacity. And we are very fortunate in this district to have um, really built a, a literacy model that we can be very proud of. Uh, K-5, we have implemented with Fidelity, Readers and Writers Workshop. We've grown that this year. I'm so proud of our East Hampton Middle School literacy teachers who've embraced Readers and Writers Workshop. Um, and they have done that under extremely difficult conditions. They don't have an in-house expert the way our teachers at Memorial and Center do to go to with questions, to get guidance, to help, to ask for feedback. Um, we've been working to make sure we're meeting their needs as we can, but when I look at the conditions that most of their colleagues have across the state, um, this is a resource that they need. Uh, additionally, we know that when we send students to the middle school, um, they do receive intervention services, but it's not under the guidance of a trained literacy specialist, and that is something that I think our district should provide to the students and families of East Hampton. Uh, when we have students with reading challenges who need a higher level of diagnosis or support, um, that's something that right now we're trying to beg, borrow, and steal from other parts of the district, and it's hurting services at those other buildings. It's not really doing a fair job to what the middle school needs. So again, this is a position where this staff member would directly teach students for a good portion of their day, but would also have the flexibility to do some of that teaching with um, their colleagues in the classroom to model and coach for 
um, their colleagues, as well as being just the in-house literacy expert who's able to provide a high level of support to students, um, and then to our teachers, and then finally to our families, so that they can be assured that their students are leaving the middle level prepared to um, demonstrate complete independence at the high school level, which is what we should be able to guarantee every student and family in the stands in. Thank you. So as Superintendent Smith alluded to in his comments earlier, there are, there are a lot of exciting programs uh, as part of these requests. So, and I'm happy to highlight the ones connected in particular with advanced placement courses, capstone, and some new theater courses, as well as a couple of others. So beginning with uh, AP Physics, AP Physics is a flagship course in many, many high schools, um, and, and is yet to be here and, and to firmly root at East Hampton High School. And, you know, one of the sort of litmus tests that I use in determining whether or not it, uh, a school is ready for those, uh, is what is the relevancy of the content, um, are, are there a population of students interested in the course, and is there an enthusiastic teacher, enthusiastic slash skilled teacher to deliver the course? And I think we are, um, we, we have a green light on all counts with regard to the, that criteria. Um, and as uh, stated, especially re in, in a lot of uh, Superintendent Smith's uh, recent weekly updates, there are, um, um, there's a huge need for STEM and the STEM fields in Connecticut where a very skilled uh, labor force is needed with science, technology, engineering, and math, and AP physics certainly fits the bill. And I just want to underscore that part about student interest and also family interest about having AP Physics here. So um, it's about time we, we answer that call. You can take virtually everything I just said and apply it to AP Computer Science. Again, it sort of tackles uh, the, the STEM fields. Uh, AP Computer Science has not been around the same duration as AP Physics. However, the last few years it's caught quite the momentum in so many schools. There is a level of challenge, sophistication, and rigor to this course that is off the charts. And I think for, our, for the students that attend the school that are really looking for that challenge and that push, uh, they're gonna have it with uh, AP Computer Science for sure. AP Music Theory, you know, uh, it, it has become kind of catchy to turn the acronym STEM into STEAM where you infuse the A to stand for the arts. Certainly AP Music Theory, I would put this as an honorable mention tied with AP Physics as a request coming from either students or from parents about uh, you know, we need this here at East Hampton High School. When is it going to come? Well, hopefully it's going to, going to be coming for the, n the next school year. So this is going to be a, a, a great offering for our students. Transitioning to Capstone at, at a very, very low or, or no cost, uh, this, is, uh, this brings a source of great pride for, for students when they're done. Well, staff and also uh, just for the community with the culminating expo typically happening at, at the end of May. It is currently in its fourth year iteration here at the high school and uh, th there's just tremendous enthusiasm by, by, the, um, by, by those that oversee it. If approved, this culminating project will be infused in, in an elective offering for students where students as seniors can elect to take this as a semester course during their senior year providing those students with direct access to teachers, where they take a passion project or a career-related related project, receive that day-to-day -day support, and really work toward developing um, a product that showcases everything. It showcases our core values. It showcases uh, all of the, uh, the life-ready skills that we are trying to impress, not only throughout the high school, but in all the schools leading up to the high school. So this is, um, this is the potential for a very exciting venture. Uh, I looked to the theater courses before, so we're, we're looking to add at least two theater courses going into the next school year, um, and th this just hits another dimension and another section of students to truly broaden our offerings. I'm just going to go one step for further. In addition to adding two courses there for, for, for students to choose from in, in a theater program, this would help really uh, round out some, some other things being, um, being added on the table there. A, um, a course in the music department entitled The Art of the Voice, that coupled with the AP Music Theory, um, and that will kind of help with the, the point two request to, um, um, to, to turn that position from a point A position into a 1.0 position. And also in our English department, a couple of new offerings, Dramatic Literature and Shakespeare 
uh, uh, electives offerings. These are great courses. I would say the, com the common denominator for all of those courses is there is a performance component to them where students are either in front of their peers in the classroom or if not directly on the stage where every time they're culminating with their assessments, they're doing it because th they, have, they have something to do. Um, where, where they're showcasing everything they've been working on for a week, two weeks, or three weeks. So these are really, really exciting, I'll call them units, but for our students who will be very excited about that learning, they won't look at it from a very formal unit perspective. They'll say, okay, in Shakespeare we're tackling this book, or we're going with this play, or we're going here with this piece of music. So it's going to be very, very exciting for our students. So, thank you. So as Mary mentioned, there's uh, quite a few changes going on at the middle school next year. And one of the things I'm here to talk to you about tonight is how we're going to adjust and customize our schedule to maximize the use of our staff. Um, we're looking to go to a back to a traditional seven period schedule. That's going to provide our students with a lot more continuity in terms of what they can expect Monday through Friday. The class periods uh, are going to also allow us to buff up the world language offerings if we do have that uh, old language staff member added to the budget. Uh, PE offerings would be increased as well. Classes look to be about 46 uh, minutes, and it would be, as I said, a seven period day. We still would maintain our flex block that we currently have. Both students and teachers have mentioned how it's, it's uh, really supportive of the child's education, both from an enrichment opportunity, as well as a remediation opportunity for uh, getting those students back on track during that, that course of time. That's pretty much all I have for you for scheduling. Thank you. All right, at Center School, very excited to uh, present the opportunity to build a uh, STEM lab in our building. Um, Mr. Smith often talks about survival skills. Uh, you know, my vision of this is really an incubator for those survival skills. Um, you see flashes of them around Center School when you walk around the hallways, but this is where they will live. When you look at two of our profile, the graduate terms, uh, curiosity and creativity, um, that's at the core of everything that we're going to do in here. Um, so we're looking to create an environment, both a low and high tech environment, where it's everything STEM interacting with the world around them. Um, for the past two years while I've been at Center School, we've tried to have add-on experiences, whether it be through the Invention Convention, Lego Robotics, uh, Coding Club, but that has provided limited opportunity to limited students. We want to provide this opportunity to all our students. They deserve this chance. Um, in talking with uh, Ms. Clark about Pratt & Whitney, we actually have somebody coming in, another one of those opportunities, um, every Friday for the next six weeks, an engineer from Pratt & Whitney who's teaching a select group of our students about some of the uh, coding and engineering um, techniques, philosophies that they use in uh, Pratt and Whitney with uh, the fighter uh, jet program. He does um, different coding and, and um, manipulations and models uh, with that, so it's very interesting, and they'll take some of that and then actually create a, a product out of that. Um, but with the, uh, the Makerspace Lab, we're looking to have all sorts of opportunities, again, for students to actively um, engage with the world around them. So whether that's through things like creating solar cells, uh, simple levers and simple machines, um, through pneumatics, uh, hydraulics, uh, working with gears, um, a, a very engaging course for, uh, for students. And again, we'd look to utilize the new coach um, that would be 4-8 and uh, that STEM advisor that would be floating between the two buildings to help lead that program, but it's really a, a self-directed uh, opportunity for the students um, where there'll be some direct teaching, some group work, um, but overall a lot of exploration. Um, in terms of funding for that, uh, we have been reaching out to a number of different resources, whether it be Discovery Education, Samsung, um, Hess, Pratt & Whitney, uh, as well as a number of other um, major uh, retailers as well as uh, science and technology um, you know, corporations that look to fund some of these programs within the school system. So we're waiting to hear back from that, uh, but we look for a very robust program uh, over the next year. Hello, well, we're going to talk a little bit about some things at Memorial School, one of which is going to be the NIAC accreditation process. First and foremost, we're proud and happy to be able to offer quality preschool programming to our kids. We really feel it's a 
springboard to their outcomes as they travel through their, their educational journey at East Hampton. Um, this is a four-step process that's really gonna work to develop a shared understanding of that commitment to quality. Right now we are in the self-reflection process and I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the efforts of our preschool team. They have been working very hard to put together a classroom portfolio. We have to do a classroom portfolio and a program portfolio. We have to meet criteria in 10 standards. And the criteria for the classroom portfolio is a 20 page document full of criteria. And for the program portfolio, it's a 24 page document. So we have a lot of work to do to gather evidence to demonstrate our quality preschool programming. This is something that is a requirement for the funding that we get from the State Department of Education for our Smart Start program. But because we feel this accreditation process will be such a good reflective exercise for us and it will be the mark of a quality educational program for our preschoolers, we're gonna do it for all three of our classes. And I'd just like to highlight the foundations. Um, so as Mary had said, the foundation of reading um, starts at Memorial with our youngest learners. And it was uh, through really a year looking at our programming to decide which way, which program that Memorial teachers would like to do. Ideally, we would have hoped that this year, kindergarten and first grade was implementing foundations. We were only able to do it in first grade. And it has, uh, teachers started in October and the um, results of the program have been phenomenal. So. If, and I was going to talk a little bit about what Foundations is, but we could go online and look at all of the components of the program. What I can share is teachers started um, in October when the materials had arrived. Thank you to Joey and um, Bauer and Jess Warner and our first grade team for their commitment to learning all of the elements. It is multi-sensory, it is kinesthetic, it is incredibly structured, and it teaches, and forgive me, I'm gonna read them because I won't remember to do all of them. Phonemic awareness, phonics and word study, high frequency word study, reading fluency, vocabulary, comprehension strategies, handwriting, and spelling. And there are, it goes from um, whole class, kinesthetic, there are manipulatives, it's color based, I think probably the biggest takeaway for foundations is while English is perceived to be such a hard language with no regularities, there are lots and foundations teaches that to our early readers so that they understand that there are lots of things that are the same about words. And in our first grades already, just after a few months, kids are identifying trick words it's transferring to all of their other work. They're announcing that's a trick word. In their writer's workshop, they're underlining the double letters. They're circling the trick words. They're saying this is a base word and that's a suffix. And so already it's transferring. Um, and we're really excited about it. Um, and if, so the hope is that it starts in kindergarten with all of those foundational skills and they take that work into first grade with them where we build the momentum in, um, in our reading skills. Mr. Bojan. So I'll just uh, go over, Paul did the uh, update on special education last week and shared uh, information about the uh, investment and success of our internal special education program. Um, and I've shared several times about the increasing number of special education students every year that we have. Uh, I just read a study last week that the number of children identified with autism has doubled in the past six years. Um, and those numbers are certainly reflected uh, when we go over that uh, with the updates every year. Uh, but despite the increasing number of special education students, uh, we haven't experienced a drastic uh, special education cost over the past few years. Um, and this is a result of the development of the new programs, increased capacity of programs, uh, which has provided an opportunity for students who uh, would have likely been outplaced to be education, educated in the home school uh, alongside their peers. Um, I've talked about these programs at um, board meetings over the last few years. Um, the development and growth of these programs with ongoing professional development for special education staff has resulted in academic as well as social, emotional, adaptive, behavioral gains for students with disabilities ranging from dyslexia, autism, uh, ADHD, to intellectual disabilities. But in addition to the benefits of students being educated alongside their peers, it's also more cost-effective to program for students uh, in the home district. 
Um, these programs have resulted in a cost avoidance from outplacements of over a million dollars in just the past three years. And when you look at, when you compare the cost, when you compare the cost of outplacing students attending all of our internal programs that we've developed uh, to the cost of staffing these programs, but we have a cost avoidance of over two and a half million dollars annually from these programs. Um, and we, you know, we don't have a crystal ball. We don't know what what will take place tomorrow. We don't know what those unavoidable costs would be. Um, you know, if someone's going to have an outplacement, we could have one in, in next week, tomorrow. Um, but I'm confident that if we continue to grow the capacity with our programs in district and with the staff in those programs, with the related service staff and special ed staff, we provide services that are as good as the private facilities um, in, in students' home school with their peers in a more, they have a more reasonable cost of the outplacements. Um, and, I, and I think that's you know, been reflected and uh, I, I think it's, it shows that these programs are really paying off and they're good for the kids and they're, uh, they're cost effective. Thank you. Um, at your seats tonight, Karen passed out a kind of a breakdown of various line items. Um, our next two meetings, February 11 and February 25, you'll go through those in detail. If you have any questions about them in advance, get the questions to us so we can come prepare for the February, <coughs> excuse me, for the February 11 meeting. <laughs> Karen, did you want to uh, introduce any particular pages of that to anybody? Well, I uh, have provided the same summary of the key categories and objects that gave you them two weeks ago. And I'd just like to highlight that those are, the key assumptions are listed in every one of those category uh, descriptions. And then within the packet that you have tonight, beginning at uh, page eight are the uh, key statistics about the staffing, the number of positions and, and where they are by buildings. And then that's followed by another 20 some odd pages of uh, really the details of those positions in a history by the, by the very low, like very high, uh, small level counts. And then, so this focus is really on staffing and benefits, which is 83% of the budget. Two weeks from now, I'll, I'll bring another addendum for the other parts of the budget. I also have emphasized the uh, grants and funds that are, uh, are the efforts to, find, to rely on other funding sources besides these champion taxpayers. And if I could take the liberty of pointing out on page uh, 46, we uh, highlight the, uh, you know, East Hampton is already doing a lot of sharing as was described in the meeting uh, ahead of this meeting. And as Mr. Mosher just said, he's developed an internal program that has already uh, come to the attention of two external districts permitting us to receive income, that's the STARS program, and permitting us to uh, distribute some of our existing costs over to this program and billing for tuition. Um, and then in the very back is the detail of every single account in history for two completed years, but I do have to caution that there's some uh, comparability concerns because uh, the state changed uh, the reporting system that we had to provide uh, every single year, and that's in relation to some federal requirements that we had to put all of our staff and all of our uh, facilities related from electricity expenses down to building levels, which previously we used to have almost consider special education like its own separate building, which is handy for other state reports, but, but not if they mandated it to go to the building level. So it makes it a little hard to compare. Uh, things that used to be in a special ed building are now in Memorial School Center School, Middle School, High School. But uh, I tried to provide some roadmap for that, but I, I know it's a little challenging. But again, questions, please let us know. And part of the reason that, that accounting has changed, and, and you know, Karen said it, it was a state requirement, in towns with 
10 elementary schools. They're looking for equity across districts. We have one elementary, one center school, one middle school, one high school, so you know, it, it's, it's, the purpose of that is not for us. However, you can see in larger districts, just to make sure that there's an equity of expense across all elementary schools, if there's a couple of middle schools, et, 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 et cetera. So that's, that's why the state has asked us to, or not asked us, there's legislation now that you, you uh, do, the, do the accounting this way. I hope that you'll take the time to look through this in advance of the meeting. Karen will walk you through several pages on February 11th. Uh, but in the meantime, if you have questions prior to that, like I said, just email me. We'll bring the, the answers right to the, to the board meeting on the 11th. Okay. Now we'll actually, guys, can stay here. <laughs> Put you on the hot seat. So we'll get into the, the workshop workshop part of this now. Um, and, and I had a, a question for each of the schools, but for all of you, with two weeks ago, Paul presented his budget. We got the green, the yellows, and the reds categories. If anybody needs a copy of that, this document is right up here as well. That's right. Pete Brown took mine, so I can another one. <laughs> um, so for each of the schools, if there were one or two yellow, even red items that you, as a principal, you as a school, feel is a priority that was left out of the green category. Is there something that fits fits that description that you would plead to be put in the left? Why don't we go right from um, high school down? Okay. Right. No more than two. No. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going, I'm going to preface this by saying there was, a, I, I, I'd like to put something there for, for the record. There is a, what I'm going to call a sibling request. It, you'll notice at the middle school yellow category, there is a mountain biking, uh, I, I believe, coach or advisor, I forget the exact phrasing. And there really should be one reflected at the high school for the same stipend amount of $650, uh, which, which is currently not reflected on that list. That, so that being said, and I know I don't mean that to be a, a 11th and a half hour uh, addition, um, but, um, but, but it really should be reflected because there are two um, joint positions. So I'm going to blatantly cheat here and saying a lot, all those stipends at the high school level are so important that I would lump them all into one. It would be very difficult for me to choose. Okay. So for whatever that's worth, I would say that that supports dozens and dozens of students in a variety of different capacities. Yeah. However, I will, I will offer one line item for, for you as a board to give strong consideration to, and that is the athletic trainer, the $4,500 over what I would say would be a $13,000 uh, increase over the course of three years. That $4,500 translates to additional games being covered by the athletic trainer here at our home base. That means more JV games, that means more freshman games. This is a tremendously popular request uh, amongst families, be it parents, student athletes, coaches, what have you. The, the idea that, uh, and, and I can't say that this is the thinking, but the idea that a concussion can't occur at those lower levels or a torn ACL where that first point of contact being the trainer uh, is just as likely to happen in those contests and those students that are about to participate, those student athletes that are about to participate in those contests need the same level of attention. Um, putting us closer to $30,000 does the following if we were to get there in three years. It allows that athletic trainer to, in fact, have office hours to be based here at the school. So that way there, when school lets out at 2.15, before a practice, before a home contest, before a away contest, she is here. And uh, that, uh, that is tremendous, that's a tremendous asset for our school and, and for you to give consideration. But I'm also mindful of that that's a significant cost. But $4,500 helps service dozens and dozens uh, more students. Question. Because of that not being available here, do a lot of the JV games and other games happen away and not at home? No, they, they become uncovered games. They become uncovered gotcha. contests. So the current arrangement, I'll add one, one level, one important layer to understand. So the arrangement and the sort of agreement we have with uh, um, um, the, the Marble cl the Clinic is that if something like that were to happen and a student athlete expresses concern about a rolled ankle or whatever it might be, mom or dad takes them to the clinic and they get that same level of attention and our trainer is also based there too. Um, but having that immediate point of contact to help supplement and support coaches and so on and so on, concussion's a concussion. 
and, and other severe injuries or, or other severe injuries. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for covering that up. Sure. Yeah. Well, now I don't even need to say that. Perfect. That's great. Sorry, uh, Jim. You're fine, please. I'll take your time. Uh, so, selfishly, I'd have to say uh, initially, I'd like to have the assistant principal be put back to 12 months. Yeah. That's selfishly. Uh, <laughs> if I'm viewing that as a, an opportunity for me, me to be a more proactive leader and have less of my resources this summer utilized for for things like scheduling and uh, preparing communications for the school year, I can do more things to better the school if I have, uh, have the assistant principal with me during that time, as well as it provides us an opportunity. I feel like sometimes we even get to talk during the day. Uh, <laughs> provides us an opportunity to really realign and, and talk about what we want to see for the building. But that is selfishly. If I were to put two, for, two, two things forward, one uh, would definitely be looking at furniture. As you know, last year we, uh, went to Yukon and, and pillaged them. <laughs> and we went to uh, uh, William J. Johnson in Colchester, yeah. and we, uh, we stole desks and chairs and all kinds of stuff from them. So uh, we, we found opportunities to do that, but it really is something that when we have average class sizes of over 23 kids, and then some class sizes upwards of 30 children, um, the big bulky old school desks are really problematic and, and, and difficult to navigate and difficult to um, support some of the curricular changes that we're looking to put into place or are putting into place. For example, when you want to do group work, putting those desks together in groups is, is very difficult and being able to navigate the room is difficult. Uh, science labs, looking to move to NGSS, uh, materials for that and, and furniture that aligns with what that is going to do is just something we simply don't have right now. So uh, teachers are doing the best they can, but uh, definitely think that would be a high priority for us. The second priority in terms of, again, um, allocating resources in, in our infrastructure, bringing back the department heads would be something very valuable. Um, we started last year with department heads really feeling like they had a vested interest and they had a leadership role in the building. So we had some, some tiers of infrastructure in our building so it wasn't just uh, administration and teachers. There was a real dynamic there that, that we kind of lost this year. Uh, they were running bi-monthly meetings and it was really something that was building some momentum. We're still running those bi-monthly meetings, but it's Eric and I that are basically the department heads for all the departments, which as you can imagine, uh, doesn't produce the same result. I'm not going to be able to do it as well as if I have somebody dedicated to really help run, uh, run that ship and to drive uh, the curriculum changes we're going to put in place. Questions? No. Thank you. All right, for uh, center school, it's listed there as a guidance counselor, but it's really personnel to support the social, emotional needs of our students. Um, we always look at all of our students and what are the barriers um, that's inhibiting growth. Sometimes it's not knowing how to cite textual evidence, sometimes it's an algorithm, um, but for a growing number of our population, it's a lot of the, the social, emotional needs. Um, that students are going through that is not even making them um, accessible during the day. Uh, so I, I would strongly advocate for that to, uh, to support the whole child at, uh, at Center School. Just one. Wow. One big one. Yeah, I know, one big one. At Memorial, I would uh, like to advocate for a special ed teacher in grades two and three. Right now, you'll see that there's a kindergarten first grade uh, position that we're looking to restore. I think as Rod has done a great job uh, over the years highlighting the growth in special education student population, I think we need more teaching support to go along with that. Um, and then I was just about to consult with Mrs. Clark because the next uh, selection would be tough. Um, I would love to get a, another reading specialist position restored at the Memorial School. Um, but I also feel that we need a math interventionist. Right now we have one person working alongside uh, Mrs. Lebowski to try to provide math intervention and remediation to our students and that is uh, extremely difficult to do given the number of students who do support in math. All right, questions for you guys. <coughs> Anyone have questions for the schools? Um, Mary, since you're standing up there, district-wide, I know there was you know, three more that were listed there. Is, is there one that you want to push out there or are you not at this point? 
right now, but there is a, a room right off of our library that I'm taking a look at because we would love to partner those two programs and build our LMC program to something um, a little bit more forward thinking. So I think partnering those two um, would be uh, a good move and um, within it we have the position, I know it's going to be shared, um, but there within our, our flex time as well as our special schedule, um, we would have every student rotate through um, at least once a week, if not once every two weeks, to make sure that they have um, an experience. Uh, that's one option. Another option is to go in sort of cohorts. So if you're looking at six to eight week cohorts for groups of students to move through and have an experience, that maybe bumps them out of taking their library media class for that particular section of time so that all the students can then rotate through that lab. So every student will be taught. Yes. Right. High school, Frank. When you were going through your highlights, the capstone course. Yes. No cost. How? That would be as a result of the shift in acquiring the additional 1.0 English teaching position up, up at the high school. Okay. So that's so, yeah. <coughs> Okay. Yeah. I, I think I think I see the answer now, but I just wanted to clarify. The is the um, addition of the AP Music Theory dependent on <coughs> the music teacher being that would time? help a great deal. Yes. Okay. Yep. So that's <laughs> connected. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yep. 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 Okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. Good. I have a question. Yeah. The reflex map. Yes. Is that something, I know at the, the middle school and the high school, uh, the Chromebooks, um, the, the tablets and the cards and stuff, is that something you use during the day? Are you able to have access to those? And yes, well, so, uh, yep. so, so Reflex is completely hybrid in terms of uh, in the classroom as well as at home. Um, obviously, we've seen uh, the greatest gains in, stu in students that carry that practice uh, home as well. Um, but at a time where you know, fact fluency still is important, uh, it's a very engaging tool to build that, so then obviously you can build off the fact fluency, um, and as you're working in more complex mathematical equations, um, that that's a kind of one of those foundational practices that students get a lot of use out of. Yeah. <coughs> Absolutely. Um, I actually have a question for Memorial School about the foundation <coughs> program. Is that um, cost here, is that uh, related to the starting up uh, in K and first grade, or is this cost an ongoing cost? Does it drop at all? So foundations is not an annual cost. It's a one-time cost at that level. So a lot of instructional tools and resources are moving to an annual subscription date, um, which is just industry standard at this point. Um, so you have to plan for that ongoing cost. But foundations, as Brandy was describing, is very resource rich. Um, so what we'd be purchasing, purchasing are the instructional tools for the teachers, the class sets for the students, which can be reused. So that's really exciting about foundations. There is a built-in annual cost you know, for wraparound supports, but it's at a much lower rate. I don't want to quote a number right now because I would be I would be pulling it out of thin air, and I want to make sure I'm giving you the number. But it's significantly lower um, than that cost. That is based on a startup. Okay, great. Thank you. So it's a we really see that as a one-time investment, and then it's just some some basic fees around it moving forward, which is exciting. Yeah. I have one last question for Ron. <laughs> Um, your chart that we had up there about the magnets, or no, the special ed, 
Yes. Does that include special ed needs for those at magnet schools? Or is this? It's just not placements. Just no placements. OK. So magnets aren't considered in our no. Although we are responsible for what? receiving the program and the cost. Of the yes. Well, that, well, that's what I was getting at. So if they're at a magnet school and they need any kind of services, we are responsible for those services. Yes. But that's not part of it. Correct. OK. Mm -hmm. In terms of special ed, have a, have a, I know it's only January, but as far as planning for next year and numbers of kids, do we see less kids going out place? Is it, is it looking good, looking the same, looking worse? Well, like I said, there's no crystal ball, but it's looking it's, good. It's you looking know, good. We, we have less than a half percent of our students are out place, and, and it's pretty, pretty good. And that's totally has to do with the programming that we have in district. Mm -hmm. and, and the training that we have. You know, we, almost all of our special ed teachers are certified in uh, or in the um, So they're able to provide that training um, or that uh, teaching, explicit teaching to students that uh, some of which would either require consultation services, which would be an extra cost, or outplacements. Mm -hmm. And with the programs we have um, already that we're able to take a kid here, a kid there, how are we I don't want to say marketing, but how are we approaching other districts to say, hey, we have room for, you know, for a kid if you have well, one. We want to meet the our kids first to make sure right. that well, yeah, yeah, yeah. capacity for them. Um, and, Obviously. you know, I've put the word out and, you know, then that's pretty much been enough. You know, we have, um, you know, we, we don't have a lot of extra slots right now as, as it is, but certainly, um, you know, I'm on a list of directors and sometimes they're looking um, for uh, someone that they're trying to bring back to district from an outplacement and so they want to gradually bring them back and so they put something out. Does anyone know of uh, any kind of program? So I'll respond and say, hey, you know, we have this great program in, in district if you would like to come visit and check it out. And that's how we um, have to do one of our students that's uh, joining us. How do we do like evaluation and diagnostics when a kid is seems to be starting to have problems. Do we do in-house evaluation diagnostics or do we send them out someplace to get evaluated or? We, we usually do that in-house. In That's why we have the you know, school psychologists, the BCBAs, OTs, PTs, so they, they do a pretty comprehensive uh, assessment. Okay, so we can cover yeah. all kinds of issues when they develop to diagnose. Yeah, on occasion we'll have that outside evaluation, but for the most part they're by the house. Okay. Okay, as this is a workshop, Open it up. Anyone in the room for comments, specific questions? Um, feel free. You know, just give your name and address for the record. But anyone and thoughts or anything? Um, I'm not seeing anything. Can I have a, get a question to? Karen, um, I noticed on the budget the um, dues and fees was um, pretty much reduced by a chunk. Um, are we cutting something out, or because I doubt I doubt prices aren't going down for memberships and things, but are we? You know, is there anything that's enabling us to decrease the amount by that much? The uh, Middlesex Consortium. Uh, oh. Oh, okay. Yes, okay. Yes. I thought that was still kind of going, though, even though Donna Finkelstein wasn't head of it anymore. I thought it was still kind of a group. Or. Uh, it was uh, Paul Merritt who answered that better than I. It was my understanding that it uh, was not okay. going as strong as it was. Yeah. And certainly the, the cost of it did drop dramatically uh, from last year this year. And it's um forecast to drop. So as a group is where is Paul? Oh, there you are. I left. <laughs> so as a group, they're not officially a group, but yet you guys like, because you talk about Mary meeting with yeah. those consortium members, you're still kind of like your own little 
group that you're meeting with, but it's not an official. It's become a very informal group. Informal group. I, okay, that's my word on the juice. Uh, so. Two years ago, there was a full-time director. Right, Our dues paid for too. that person's salary. Mm -hmm. Now we're doing things uh, informally. It's been taxing for the director of curriculum. It's been taxing for our guidance director because it's falling on them to do the career. Uh, right. The big career yeah, fair and yeah, everything, yeah. where there was a dedicated person who each of our dues paid yeah. for that person to okay. to put that together. Okay. okay. Well, then, with no other questions. Uh, Chris? Oh yes. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, is it Mr. Moshe? Yes. Yeah. Um, do you foresee any of the uh, special ed kids uh, moving back into mainstream? There are some who might. I mean, that you just you never know. It depends on their disability, and uh, they're able to compensate for that disability. Um, some some students do. Um, they're evaluated, and they meet their goals and objectives. They are. I'm sorry, so they move on for that last one. Some students do move back into mainstream when they um, meet their goals and objectives. Um, a lot of times you see that at the younger level, because with maybe speech and language disorders, mm -hmm. um, perhaps once they reach second or third grade. Uh, might be reached, uh, might be moved back into mainstream. Students with more um, significant disabilities or even um, learning disabilities might require those supports throughout their school career. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Another question? Of course, yeah. Um, it goes kind of goes counterpart to the um, what more do you want? Is there anything that you can do though? And I don't need to answer that question now, but I would like it. Anything we could do without? Yeah, each one of the principles. You know, do they see any place that um, could be streamlined? Whatever. Okay. Fair question. I'll put that out. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in now. I think and speak for the group that I think when you look at the tiered list that they've gone through that process of what they feel that they would do without for next year that those items, many um, come from either community members, students, teachers, and the administrators themselves. And then that process of really reflecting on um, what, what do we feel is critical to move forward program, our programming forward, um, that's what that process reflected. And a lot of those choices were interconnected across the schools as well, so that we could look at how to move not just any one building forward, but an entire district vision. Um, so there are many things there that would be standard in school districts and are standard in school districts that neighbor us. So if I think about the fact that Memorial School and Center Schools uh, share a literacy, uh, I'm sorry, a library media specialist, for example, um, that's a, a challenge and, and taxing on our elementary schools to not be equipped with someone to really, uh, in a dedicated way, facilitate that part of an elementary school and library media center. The fact that we don't offer world language at the elementary level when you drive south to East Haddam and they do, or you drive um, just over to Glastonbury and they do, two very different districts, different funding sources. Um, so I think when you, when you look at those things, um, the high school still put in a yellow tier restoring a math uh, teacher. So already that would have put our department back where it was just two years ago. Um, and they've already decided to do without that. So I, I hope that the tier uh, system speaks to what the principals have done in that work and working with their teams to try and navigate um, losing department head stipends, losing coordinator positions, um, losing physical teaching positions, and not being able to have all of those um, sort of supports around the instructional practice that colleagues of theirs in other <coughs> districts would uh, benefit from. And of the eight positions that we started without this year, two of them are being restored. So I think we've already gone through that exercise and said, you know, how can we ask for a reasonable increase and we're not going to be able to restore six teachers, an additional six of the, of, of the eight that haven't been restored. And so what we've done is we've redone the middle school schedule that frees up four teachers. We've got the reading specialists to take care of the, the, the reading needs of the, of, of the students that, that, that that suffer from poor reading skills at this point. So I think we've done that internal process as we've, as we've moved forward. We lost eight teachers last year, two were restored. That's all that we're adding, the two that have been restored. We've prioritized them as the, as the, um, as the STEM position and we're restoring the world language position. And then internally, we're, uh, we're restoring one of the English positions at the high school. 
uh, we're adding a couple of special ed teachers because I think I explained last time with the success of our programs that prevent students from being outplaced that we created without additional staff. We're finding that we do need the additional staff back to, to support the students that aren't necessarily in those uh, outplacement alternative programs. So I think we've, you know, we've done that exercise as we put the, put the budget together. Um, you know, should the budget be cut, you know, then we've got to go through and decide. You know, the, the, um, you also went through the, what more do you want? So that's why I'm asking. Yeah, no, and, and I think, yes. and I didn't think about it either, but the, the yellow and the reds, I think, answer that question. These are things that they would like, but they're willing to do without to move forward, mm -hmm. I, I think, is the best way to look at it. Well, can I comment just one thing, too? Because last year, when I was new to this process, and I saw um, Paul's breakdown of the, you know, green is the stuff that we are having. This is the stuff that we need but can't have. This is the stuff that we should have but we absolutely can't afford. That gives you, like, it gave me as a taxpayer a why, like, my eyes were wide open realizing how much we should have that we already cut. That's really what I came out of it last year with, with seeing it as a taxpayer who knew nothing about the process or what went into it. It was very awakening to me, all the things that I wish, I had said I think at one of the meetings to Paul, like, well, how much is this percentage to give them everything on this list? Because everything on that list to me, as a parent of, who had two kids that came through this school and who may or may not have grandchildren coming up through this school and have been in this town all my whole life, I was shocked at some of the things that we weren't providing. That's the very reason why I brought that up in the Chai Board meeting, because I think it's such a, a useful tool to us on the education side, and I know exactly why Chris asked the principals that question, because it also informs us, you know, to kind of think about, you know, if the principals could have one more thing, or, you know, what would it be, and it kind of, it, you know, we're, we're looking at a budget now, but we also have to think about the future too and what might be a priority next time. Um, it's not all, you know, totally short term and just in this budget cycle. I find it informative to see, you know, just to know what the building principals think, you know, managing their own. And it's not arbitrary either. I mean, they, they, they're they the process. <coughs> address the textbook workbook line. Um, what workbooks are we currently are in our district that are like we have to buy every year because that's the fundamental of the program? Uh, a number. Uh, for example, the Go Math materials. Yep. Eight. That's what I thought. Okay. Spelling Connections 2-5. <coughs> Foundations will have a little bit of that as I already answered. It's not nearly, uh, the whole program is not built that way, but there would be some very minimal funding that way. Okay. So as for software subscriptions, are we doing away? Because there's a big decrease in that line item, and I'm just wondering, what are we doing without? Are we changing programs that don't need it, or are we just No, we're not allowed those buying? initial costs over the last couple of years. Like last year, we had initial buy-in to certain programs, and now we don't have that. That's what I was wondering. I mean, we went from 105,000 to 60. Line item 5641, yeah, I'm just looking at the basic um, budget overview. We went so from. This year, in 1819, you approved the no number. A couple years more of uh, GOMAP, the uh, Next Generation Science Standard Investment. Uh, this money is pretty much the items that have been on the uh, items that have been, are, been approved on the uh, superintendent's uh, list we were just up there a few minutes ago. So it's the uh, foundations and the uh, textbooks for um, 
the advanced placement classes. The advanced placement bio and, and physics, we, we would need to buy textbook levels or more yeah. materials. Yeah, yeah. But if you buy this one. Okay. So it's, so I'd, so the number we're budgeting for next year really just gives us exactly what we need with nothing extra for the OE you'd like to purchase, blah, blah. I mean, it's, it's pretty down on the wire. Yeah. It, is, it is down to the wire. Okay, that's just one. Because it, I mean, it's a big decrease from the previous year. I was wondering why that happened, so, okay. Okay, so February 11th and February 25th will be the two big meetings where we're gonna go through each of the line items and the books and make our final recommendation on the 25th and vote and send it to the town. So, any questions about that? Okay. Any other final questions about I just have budget one stuff? Question. Yep. Since we're going to do the bonding for um, the repairs for the boiler, mm -hmm. I'm curious. In the maintenance, did we account for the fact that a lot of, that they estimated twenty-five thousand a year for repairs? Was that backed out of this? Well, the and Karen can answer this too. If I if I, you know, we, we kind of put a a repair line in there. There's yeah. a lot of things that we haven't been repairing, you know, as far as HVAC systems and, and things like that. So we'll actually get a little reprieve from the, from, from the boiler. From the boiler. Taking all to do the some money. of the other repairs that, that, that need to yeah, be done. Yeah, because it's not in a separate line item, like center school boiler. It's all just maintenance repair. I know. Yeah, unfortunately. So, but I think that's good. Now we'll be able to catch up. I would hate to take 25,000 out of there. No. Because I think we already, well, I'll take responsibility. I've already cut that line item several times, and I think Don Howard always says to me, what's, what's the term he uses? It's, run to failure. Yeah, right, run to failure, but he also says there's, uh, he, he uses like where, I'll have to get the term, but you know, he says, you're at risk with that little line item for, for, for repairs. Well, like I mean, two years, you, thank you. Yeah, I mean, two years ago the budget line was 370. The year before that it was it was 388, and I'm, you know, so now we're down to asking for 303. Well, and every year our stuff gets older and older, yeah. and it's going to. Curiosity question. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah but no, 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 it makes sense. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, it's you know we we have a lot of aging different right. aging come facilities up, materials um, when it's. Bond is written and delivered to board of finance, and mm -hmm. that question may come up. Yeah, it's good to know. Yeah. Good to know ahead. Yeah. We could put a list of. Um, Something else will break. We'll give you a list of, <laughs> of, of repairs from last year and repairs that we've done so far this year. Yeah. yeah. And I think, yeah, well, anything that we deferred over the course of the year to this year or. Okay. All right, then. We are going to move on. We have a presentation from Memorial School that I am going to move out of the way for. Yes. So while Paul is setting that up, I'll just give a quick introduction of an invite Mr. Gonzalez and Mrs. Godori to add anything that they would like as I just say both quick words. Um, I want to say thank you to Sue Freeman and Ginny Quinn who are here. Um, Sue, our physical therapist, and Ginny, our occupational therapist who work uh, with students at many different levels, different ages, in a lot of different ways. We're very fortunate to have their expertise in district. Um, is Jenny still there? She's there. Oh, there you are, Jenny. Sorry, I thought I saw you down. Um, and I think this is an interesting presentation because one of the things that we focus on a lot in the budget process is things like core academic programming, um, class size, how many teachers we have on a grade level, all things that you know I speak to my heart very closely. But um, there's so much else that a school district is tasked with uh, providing to students to ensure that we are um, delivering appropriate and necessary supports to them. And um, the, the, the teams that support our students in East Hampton are really beyond the classroom teachers. Um, our classroom teachers, often you'll see online, there's kind of these funny memes that go around and say like, I teach, what's your superpower? So our teachers take on tremendous responsibility and deliver so much to our students each day in the classroom, but they do that 
um, fortunately, with some supports in this district. And um, I'm, I'm proud to introduce Sue and Jenny, who uh, their work you might not hear about as much when we look at budget and class size and class t uh, classroom teachers, but um, as part of our student services and related services team, uh, they work closely with students across the district to ensure that their needs are met. Uh, they do that in relation to, uh, at times, special education services, but also in proactive ways. And we wanted to feature something that they brought to Memorial School this year to show how um, we're engaging learners in a number of ways. So I don't know if... Uh, yeah, I, I just think it's great that uh, Sue and Jenny went out of their way to collaborate with the team within Memorial and expand their uh, their room out into the knuckle areas. They have one of the favorite rooms in the building, and uh, to see that they were able to take some of the exercises that help our learners and put it out in our knuckle area, uh, it's great to see, and it's getting a lot of use. So I think they're going to kick out of uh, watching our kids in action. So uh, Sue and Jenny are here to share with us the Memorial School's movement path. So I just wanted to give you a chance to say a few words about um, how this supports students and sort of how you came to implement this at Memorial School, and then we'll get to see it in action. Perfect. Sounds good. Well, thank you so much for having us here. We're so excited about the movement path and happy to share it with you. It, the movement path, you're going to see in action, so you'll see exactly what it is. But in essence, it's an area in the school that any student can access when they need to get some energy out, they need a quick, safe way to move a little bit and then get back to class so that they can focus better. Um, it started when Andy and a couple other teachers saw on social media some other schools across the country and some um, internationally that had created paths like this that were successful for their students and Andy came to Ginny and myself and asked if maybe one of the knuckle areas in the hallways could be utilized to help the students. So we did a little research, um, but a little challenge because the hallways at Memorial are carpeted, so the tape and adhesives that a lot of these paths that we were looking at online weren't going to work for us, but we did find a great Velcro system. Um, it comes in strips, designs, patterns, it's brightly colored and it works perfect. You can vacuum over it, you can still clean, it's durable, and, um, and the PTO was gracious awesome. enough to supply that. So right, we gave them our, our idea, and they, they approved and, and purchased the equipment for us. Um, so some of the activities that you'll see um, with a, well, a special guest and a little girl that's doing it, you'll see they incorporate um, a couple different things. They were actually um, chosen for specific reasons. So there's certain activities that involve an element of balance, an element of placing your feet in appropriate spots that provide students with movement. And movement is really important for a lot of students to help their nervous system stay in a good spot for learning. So you have some students that are what we call sensory seekers and they tend to kind of need to move and it helps them learn. And then you have some students who need movement to kind of keep the nervous system alert and awake. So these activities help both those um, kinds of students so that they can be at their optimal state for learning. Um, there's other activities that provide what we call heavy work activities. So those are things that provide um, input to your joints, your muscles. So pushing things, pulling things, lifting up heavier items. And that activates what's called your proprioceptive system, and that sends information to neural, neural tracts that just help to organize your brain. So the movement path has a lot of activities that you'll see that incorporate some kind of a heavy work activity. And finally, we also tried to put in some activities that involve crossing midline, which is just a really important developmental <laughs> step for academic tasks, daily living skills, um, sports activities. And so as a result, all of those kinds of activities provide students with an outlet where it's kind of a controlled environment. Um, we're getting them to focus and um, be at their best state for learning in the classroom. So, so we are able to do a lot of these activities in our um, PTO team room, mm -hmm. but we have so many pieces of equipment that would be unsafe for a student to access without an adult with them. Whereas this location, a student can leave class for two or three minutes we designed it so that it was, um, there's there's nothing there that could be harmful or dangerous 
A student can run through it and head back to class. Mr. Gonzalez. I was just going to make a recommendation maybe to Mr. Smith and the Board of Ed. Between your tri board meetings and your budget workshop, we can design one of these next time to keep us all And we invite you to come to the school and see it. Anytime you're at Memorial, you can run through it. Oh. I thought this was on Paul's computer. <laughs> oh, well, is that right? Do you know a secret now? Is that your favorite? Little uh, salsa. That's it. That's the music that goes. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Yeah. We'll start from here. So when you see the cheetah, she's holding the cheetah stuffed animal. Um, Chitty, I did a little surgery and stuffed them with heavy cuts, so it's heavy. Oh, sweet. So the curving is a special type of movement that just gets into your brain. So just walking a straight line and having her curve around. This is some of the heavy work activities. She's doing wall push-ups against the wall. This is a squat. Push those muscles and joints. There are more cheetahs in the laundry basket. And, yeah. some and some rings of paper, too, so it's actually pretty heavy. So she's turning, she's jumping. This is the crossing midline. Today's been a really busy day. I sure could go for a movement break. <laughs>
that's our mid path, and uh, we're so happy to be able to share it. That's awesome. So about how many kids a day do you think go through the? Oh gosh, um, I don't know how many, but usually as I'm cycling the building, somebody's there. Um, there are a lot of staff members that will bring their students there, and there are a lot of kids that, that just ask to leave for a few minutes and, and come back. And I think the teachers have a good idea of who they can who needs send and who will come back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and who might need a little kindness. How late are you? <laughs> but we haven't had any complaints yet um, of students abusing it or staying there too long. And we've gotten a lot of feedback. I actually tried to take a couple of little videos uh, interviewing the kids after they used it. They were so shy that yeah. they, they didn't really say too much, but um, they enjoy it. I think the kids have been very responsible using this. I think mm. it's something that they are feeling like they need and they don't want to get it taken away. Right. So they're being very responsible with it. Have you had anybody, uh, you know, parent contact you guys that the kids come home and talk about it or say or express to them this made me, you know, Focus better. That maybe not use obviously the words focus. But, right. You know, yeah, I don't know. they were ready directly. for homework or whatever. <laughs> I don't know. Not yet directly, but it's brand new. Brand new. So okay. Yeah. We'll get to, we also have a um, a new element we'd like to add to it for kids who need a little challenge, and that we're going to have um, a coffee can or something with sticks in it, and they can pull one and it'll say go backwards or mm -hmm. variation. Can you do this this way? Can you do it that way? Mm -hmm. You know, what kid doesn't and like to do it? And they do a bean bag on their right. head, things nice. like that. Yeah. I often thought when kids get antsy in the wind and just let them do a loop around the hallway and mm -hmm. come back and breathe a little and so It does help. I just, yeah, I'm just sitting up there doing some meetings. You know, especially if they can't go out at recess even. Right, at the same time we are at recess all day. I often thought that when you can't, you know, by the time they're in the afternoon, they're, you know, elsewhere and they just pull it off that steam and boom. It does, it does seem to help. Good. Well, I want to thank both Ginny and Sue for coming tonight to present and stay through the workshop. So thank you both so much. Um, and I think one of the components that um, we're really looking to grow for our learners is learners to be self-directed learners, but also self-regulated learners. And so by having this tool available to students to identify that this would assist me right now as a learner is exactly the kind of environment that we want to support in our schools. Um, and as both Sue and Jenny described, the, helping them to recognize early the relationship between um, their, their physical body and their mental space and their readiness for learning to get into that optimal zone. Um, Isn't that a whole mindset? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. some of that self-regulation and, and being a self-directed learner, both with tasks and initiation and efficiency, but also what do I need right now to kind of get into that place? We're going to talk more about that um, at a future presentation around social emotional learning. So this kind of just gives you a little snapshot of the work we're doing in a proactive way for learners, but we'll also talk about some of the larger structures that we're using in a future meeting. So thank you both. Thanks for having us. bring up before we get up too far off budget talk. Uh, Bridget brought up earlier, and I'm glad she did. Jeff Joka on the town side is, I think for the second or third year now, going into the um, portal, what's it called? Um, what's the word for it? On the website with the budget breakdown and all the line items, portal. Um, you mean dashboard? Dashboard, dashboard. that's <laughs> the word. I need to drink more coffee. So with, he's doing that, again, for the town side of the budget and has offered to create it for the Board of Ed side. I think prior to the bifurcation, there was one portal like that dashboard, but since the split, it hasn't happened. So I, Karen, we haven't really talked to you about it, but I think Jeff is offering to help and develop it if we are in favor of doing it. And so for me, I'm is, all for getting yeah, the information as whatever is. Absolutely. In, info about the more detailed information about the budget. Yep. Yeah. 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 Okay. Any concerns with that from anyone? Okay. So good. We'll give them the go ahead and 
more that, information the taxpayers have, that's the better right. off and better Sorry. educated they are. And but at some point, you know, somebody can put a link to it, right, to the Let's Talk East Hampton page, and they can go right facts. on it and click it. Yeah. Yeah. It's because not just a lot of people do look at the page, yes. and if they, if all they have to do is click and click, they'll they'll look at it's it. It's a lot easier. Yeah. But it's not just throwing numbers up there. What do you mean? Well, like I mean to just put a budget up there with numbers, you know, means not much unless you have, you know, some meat behind it. Oh, I think there's description in everything. Oh like yeah, like we're talking about. Yeah. Putting the line of items in the way it's set up so it's yeah. easy to okay, understand. Yeah, I wouldn't yeah, imagine not just, you could have to put the minutia of figuring out, because believe me, yeah. I'm the last yeah. person that's going to do that, but I'm going to see a nice line item thing. Yeah. You know, budget season, how much extra work is this going to be, Karen? I, I know, and, and I don't. I think it's all uh, just you know, the news information that it'll. Yeah, it'll, it'll feed in updates itself. This. And, uh, It's kind of what, what you've been doing the last couple of years, just now we're moving it to a more public and setting. As long as you're not the same place. Yes. No, yeah. OK. And would it include those red, the yellow, and the light? I think, I really think it's led to our, the, the uh, accounting system behind the scenes. So it's the actual. Which is, yeah. is this information, but it's just twirled in a different way. Lois, and that, um, that both budget documents that we've done and will include Karen's uh, as of next week, those have all been emailed to all the school community, um, all parents, and anybody on my um, distribution list. Yeah, I just know where sometimes they get the information. And it's, even though it's even, and I know, like, you're <laughs> great at, I, I know you're great at communicating, but sometimes, you know, the parents will, they'll see it in a thread, and then they'll still click on it because, they've not that you know, that maybe they didn't open the email or whatever. But you know what I'm saying? Yep. Yes. Okay, unfinished business. We have a new business. We have three policy first reads. Um, yes. They are all legislative updates. Um, in fact, I think two of them are very similar. Yeah, the, uh, the first, you see, 5141.21, uh, that is, uh, in regard to uh, administering medications to students, and it adds bus drivers in that language, right? Is that, that's, it's only the blue bit, so we are now. Correct, so uh, page J talks about um, the requirements for, as of July 1, for school bus drivers. There's also information on page F uh, that does not apply to school bus drivers, but would be, um, for any students who may suffer seizures, uh, mm -hmm. training additional people to um, administer medication. And that is all, again, and that is responsible for the legislation. DACO will be responsible for the, for the training. Now, if they would like to use us to, uh, to assist on uh, EpiPens, we, we certainly can do that. Okay. And that's the next policy, 4212.42, um, is administered. It did. Bus driver was administered. Uh, there's a language change that I, that I don't know. Is it on our copy here? I'm looking at this stuff before. Drug and alcohol uh, requirements for school bus drivers. Is that in the. 4212? Yeah. Is, right, so we changed the yep. title to requirements for school yep. bus drivers. Um, and it's about administration of meds specifically at the council. So that's 4212. Um, and the last bit, 3541. Uh, oh, this was the uh, renumbering. Um, so it's making the regulation, uh, making the numbering of its policy line up with the regulations, forms, and whatnot. Um, so that they can be cross referenced. We're just, we're just talking about it. the second paragraph on 4212, the one that starts with beginning July 1st. I mean, I read that thing over and over, and I'm like, what? Turn it right out of the legislation. Yeah, that's, that's what I said to her. It's a legislative it's, update. Yeah, so yeah, that's so why whoever wrote it. it. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's not right. clear. That's it's, right that line. Well, it's horrendous. That's why it's horrendous. Yeah, that's all. Yeah. 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 Okay. 
was made. Okay, so those will be on for February 11th. Sure. Final first approval first on that. Okay, future business. Get the budget passed. Okay. Uh, audience of citizens. We have a few left. Thank you for sticking <laughs> out. Yes, ma'am. Uh,